just going on Facebook? Uh, yeah, it's all over the internet. And it's going to be on YouTube too? Yeah, mm -hmm. it will be. Yeah. Live? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you just, if you just like Google Cross Examined on YouTube, it'll come up there. Oh, I just got the Facebook thing. Got some good students in the crowd shop. Oh, yeah, cool. Oh, yeah. Hey, well, good evening. Hey, this is a great turnout. So, yeah, hello. Uh, so I'm Joey. Uh, I'm the director of Chi Alpha here. I'm one of the groups that helped put on this event. So thanks for coming out. Uh, this is an awesome opportunity. We get to have somebody here, Frank Turk, who is an apologetic. Uh, he's, he's awesome. He has a very awesome resources here. He has two books for sale if you are interested in um, stealing from God. Right? And I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So if this, this kind of thing is interesting to you or you want to grow in your understanding and knowledge, these are some great resources. Um, card, cash, or check. So he's versatile. 
Um, so I, I'm going to get out of the way because you didn't come here to hear me talk. You came to hear Frank. So let's give a present or I give a warm welcome to Frank Turek. Thanks, Joey. Good evening, Cardinals. What'd you say? Oh, Turp, Turp. All right, good. I'm, I'm getting with the program. All right. For those of you out there watching in Internet land, you don't know what's going on right now. All right, let's go back to September 29, 2006. That's when Petty Officer Michael Mansour is a United States Navy SEAL operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Mansour is standing on a roof in Ramadi, and he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He has two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position next to him at his feet. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, Kill the Americans! As Monsor and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsor in the chest, and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying at his feet will surely die. Monsoor yells, Grenade! But instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsoor is dead. His two teammates lying at his feet receive only minor injuries because Monsoor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at Monsoor's funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush invited Monsoor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them their son's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even get through the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsoor's High School in Garden Grove, California built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsoor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident insignia that the SEALs wear dominates the 50-yard line. January 2019, North Island, California, just outside of San Diego, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsoor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet, Zumwalt class. I was just in San Diego in August. This ship is sitting in the harbor. This is Monsoor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship, named in honor of her fallen son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsoor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsoor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But in today's culture, particularly on a college campus, many people don't think the story's true. They think it's invented. After all, it was written down by religious people. We know religious people tend to embellish things. And it's got miracles in it, like a resurrection. How many people in this room have ever seen someone rise from the dead after you knew they were dead for at least 36 hours? Anyone? Anyone out there? No, none of us. Yet if you're a Christian, you have to believe something that none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? 
Well, I actually think it's quite easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to answer four questions. In other words, if you investigate these four questions, I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes. And if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. Now that is some pretty grooving music, isn't it? Yeah. That's actually from our TV show on Wednesday nights on DirecTV channel 378. How many people here have DirecTV? Can I see your hands, please? Direct TV. Like three of us. Come on, friends, don't let friends watch cable. If you want to get out and have enough faith to be an atheist, you got to get DirecTV. Actually, that's not true. It's on Roku. Who has Roku here? Roku? All right, look. Look, Roku. All right. Look for NRB, National Religious Broadcasters, on Roku. If you don't have DirecTV and you don't have Roku, it's on this new technology sweeping Muncie right now. It's called the Internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, it's broadcast on our website at that time, 9 p.m. We're also on radio every Saturday morning. Uh, now, I know if you're a college student, you don't get up until the crack of noon on Saturday, so you're not listening to it then. But it is podcasted. It's called the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. And what we do is we present evidence for Christianity, and we cross-examine ideas against it. So if you want to go more into this kind of stuff that we're going to talk about tonight, you can listen to the podcast. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. And this is going to serve as our outline here tonight. Then if I time this just right, we'll have absolutely no time for questions. No, no, no. No, we'll have time for questions later. But why are these the big four? Does truth exist? Why is that important? Because you hear people saying, there's no truth, you got your truth, I got my truth. Look, if there's no truth, obviously Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, atheism can't be true either. Now, of course, there's truth, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, if there wasn't truth, would you be paying thousands of dollars a year to come to Ball State University? Right, you're here to learn truth, right? I mean, if there was no truth, could you ever catch someone in a lie? I mean, lies presuppose truth, right? So, of course, there's truth. We're going to deal with that first. Second question, does God exist? Christianity can't be true if there's no God. We hope to see tonight through three arguments that God really exists. Now, these arguments are actually in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know these arguments. In fact, you can show that God exists without any reference to any religious writing. Third question, are miracles possible? Why is that important? Because, again... Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible. Now, I hope to show you tonight that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and even atheists are admitting the evidence for this miracle. We'll see that tonight. Then we're going to get to the key question, is the New Testament true? The New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there's no truth, no God, or no miracles. But if truth exists, if God exists, if miracles are possible... Then we can see if the documents are reliable enough. They don't have to be the inspired word of God or inerrant. We're not assuming that. We just want to see if they have good historical information in them. Because if they do, if it's really true that Jesus rose from the dead, then game over Christianity is true. Of course, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. You might as well sleep in on Sunday and do what you want the rest of the week because if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, your faith, if you're a Christian, is in vain. As the Apostle Paul himself said in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. Now, from this point, you can actually show, if the reasoning is good, that the entire Bible is true. You say, how so? Well, that's what we do in the book, but the short answer is this. If Jesus really predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead, if he really did that, that would make him God. And whatever God teaches is true. Jesus taught the entire Old Testament is the word of God, and he promised the New Testament. You say, why trust Jesus? Look, I just have a personal policy. If somebody predicts and accomplishes his own resurrection from the dead, I just trust whatever the guy says. <laughs> All right? Now, we're going to start right here at point one. Does truth exist? You guys ready to go? Yeah. All right. Now, whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. Right? 
Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, Cardinals, that was pretty lame. If he said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. You can't handle that. That's not how he said it. Here's how he said it. You can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's try it again. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Now that felt better, didn't it? Didn't you always want to do that with a professor up here? You can't handle the truth. Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't get anything else out of what we talk about here tonight, what we're about to talk about here in the next few minutes, I think, is probably the most important thinking skill I ever learned. And I didn't learn it until I was 33 years old. I already had a master's degree. And I didn't know what I'm about to show you right now, to show you what a dimwit I was. You know why? Because I never had a course in logic. How many people in here have ever had a course in logic? Can I see your hands, please? Oh, you see these people? Here are the homeschoolers. Here they are, <laughs> right here. If we taught logic in public school, things would be a lot better. What we're about to see here is using the laws of logic to detect false statements. And they're everywhere in our culture. And the easiest way of showing you this thinking skill is to give you an example of using it. If someone were to make the postmodern claim, there is no truth, you should ask that person a question. What should the question be? Yeah, if somebody says there's no truth, homeschoolers, you got it. You're going to ask them, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true. But it claims to be true. Did I say that right? Can everybody see that this is a self-defeating statement? What's a self-defeating statement? A self-defeating statement violates the law of non-contradiction, which says opposite ideas cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense. A self-defeating statement doesn't meet its own standard. It would be like if I said, I can't speak a word in English. What would you say? Yeah, you just did. Or it'd be like me saying, my parents had no kids that lived. <laughs> or my brother is an only child. Or everything I say is a lie. Some of you will get that tomorrow. <laughs> or all generalizations are false. Some of you will never get that one. All right. <laughs> These are known as self-defeating statements, and you've got to get good at identifying them because half the battle in life is avoiding what is false. If you get sucked into believing things that are false, ultimately you're going to smack up against reality, and it's going to hurt. So what's the thinking skill? What do you need to do? What you need to do is turn the claim on itself. Turn the claim on itself. So if somebody says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself. And you simply ask, is that true? Now, you don't have to be unkind to do this. You're not making statements. You're asking questions. So let's do a few more. Suppose someone says there's no such thing as absolute truth. Yeah, if someone says there's no such thing as absolute truth, you turn the claim on itself and you say, is that an absolute truth? Or you might want to say, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> Can everyone see that this is an absolute truth claim, claiming there are no such thing as absolute truths? It defeats itself. Now, in our culture, it's more often said this way today. There isn't the truth, only my truth. Right? You have your truth. I have my truth. You live your truth. I live my truth. We'll all get along. Right? It sounds so right. It sounds like we all ought to believe this. It sounds so Oprah, doesn't it? It sounds like this is just spun wisdom. You ought to know this, right? There's just one big problem with it. If somebody says, there isn't the truth, only my truth, you just need to ask this question. Is that just your truth or is it the truth? Because if you're staying, this statement up here is just your truth. In other words, it's just your opinion. Well, why should I believe it? But if you're saying this statement up here is the truth, can't you see the first half of the statement says there are no such thing as the truth? I mean, this is a the truth statement claiming there are no such thing as the truth statements. This is self-defeating. I know it's unpopular in our culture to say this, but I'm sorry, it's just true. There's no such thing as your truth. There's no such thing as my truth. There's just the truth. I mean, if you're going to say you have your own truth, you might as well say I have my own math. I mean, imagine if Mark asked me after this event, he said, hey, Mar uh, he said Frank, why don't you stay an extra day, come over to the, uh, the campus Christian house over there, help me clean up a few things, I'll pay you $10 an hour, just tell me how many hours you work. Now, actually, Mark would never do this, he doesn't pay that much. Anyway, 
But let's say I went over the house and tomorrow I worked a full day, 15 hours. And he goes, okay, what do I owe you? I go, like, it's $10 an hour times 15 hours. You owe me $150,000. He's going to say, what are you, crazy? I don't owe you $150,000. I owe you $150,000. And you go, or I go, you don't understand. I have my own math, right? He'd be, he'd, I'd be crazy to say that. And there's no such thing as my math or your math. And there's no such thing as my truth or your truth. There's just math. There's just truth. Now, often today, it's actually said this way. It's true for you, but not for me. Well, Christianity may be true for you, but Buddhism's true for me. What do you say to that? Close. This is also self-defeating. It's just a little bit more subtle. If somebody says it's true for you, but not for me, you simply want to ask, hey, is that true for everybody? Is true for you, but not for me, true for everybody? Because if true for you, but not for me, is true for everybody. Then true for you, but not for me, can't be true because it's true for everybody. Did I say that right? I know this can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. But that's because it's a self-defeating statement. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. If somebody says it's true for you but not for me, say, sure, go try that with your bank teller. Yeah, go to your bank teller and say, look, the economy's down, inflation's up, I need some extra money. I'd like $100,000 out of my account. The bank teller looks at your account and says, I'm sorry, I only have $6.12 in your account. It's easy to get the money. You simply say, ha, that's true for you, but not for me. Give me the hundred grand. <laughs> Are you going to get the money? No, if it's true there was only $6.12 in your account, that's true for all people at all times in all places when referring to your account at that time. It's just true. And by the way, it's also true that if God exists, that's true whether you believe it or not. It's also true that if he doesn't exist, he doesn't exist whether you believe it or not. You know, I often ask Christians, I often ask them, hey, do you think Christianity is true? And of course they'll say yes, and then I'll ask them why. Do you know what answer I get more than any other? Because I have faith. Is that a good answer? Does your faith change whether or not God exists or Jesus rose from the dead? No, your faith doesn't change a thing about those things. I mean, do you have to believe something to make it true? Do you have to believe in gravity to stay on the ground? The people who don't believe in gravity float away. Hey, look, there's another one. <laughs> hey, if you believe, you'll come back. No, that's not the way it works. You say, why is the Bible always talking about faith then? Because there's two kinds of faith. This is a very important distinction. There's belief that, and then there's belief in. Belief that is getting evidence that God exists, that Jesus rose from the dead, that these writings are actually telling us the truth. That's what we call apologetics. It doesn't mean we're saying we're sorry. It means we're given a defense for what we believe. But all the belief that in the world won't get your moral transgressions forgiven. For that, you've got to go from belief that to belief in. There's a difference. You see, belief that is just of the head. Belief in is not only of the head, it's of the heart. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote that little book in the New Testament called Cardinals, you are so sharp tonight. James said, even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. Do you realize that if God exists, and he does, and if demons exist, and they do, that they know that God exists better than we do? But they don't trust in him. They don't want to trust in him. There's a difference between belief that and belief in. And we know this in relationships, don't we? In fact, when I first met my wife 37 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife. But all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. <laughs> That's the difference between belief that and belief in. Now, the biographer of Jesus called John, who wrote a gospel called the Gospel of John, says in the 20th chapter that... These words were written so you may know that Jesus is the Savior, and by believing in him, you may have life in his name. Notice how he has belief that and belief in in one verse. You see, most of the time when the Bible's talking about faith, it's talking about the second kind. After you know that Jesus is the Savior, trust in him. Now, notice faith is not blind. Faith is not, I don't have any evidence, I'm just going to believe anyway. Faith is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe is true. Faith is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe is true. If you think somebody's going to make a good spouse because you have evidence they're going to be a good spouse, then you trust in them. 
right now you're trusting in the chairs to hold you up. You didn't even think about it when you sat down, but you had evidence these are strong chairs. They're going to hold me up. You went from belief that to belief in. When you get on an airplane, you go from belief that to belief in. I believe the pilots are trained. That's just belief that. Once you get on a plane, that's belief in. Right? Uh, now, you're also going to hear this, particularly here on a college campus. And that is, there's no truth in anything but science. Turn the claim on itself. Somebody says this, what question are you going to ask them? Yeah, is that a scientific truth? Can you go in the laboratory and prove that? No, that's a philosophical claim. You can't prove that in the laboratory. In fact, that's not a statement of science. That's a statement about science. And you can't do science without philosophy. Science is built on philosophy. In fact, you can't read the Bible without philosophy. You can't study any academic endeavor without philosophy. When you get a PhD here at Ball State, what does the PH stand for? It's not phenomenally dumb. <laughs> it's philosophy of, philosophy of history, philosophy of biology, philosophy of physics, whatever it is. In fact, in the book over there, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case, we have a chapter on science. And here's the title of the chapter. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Why am I saying that? Because all data needs to be gathered and all data needs to be interpreted. And who does that? Scientists do that. You ever wonder why you've gotten conflicting advice on COVID? You say, follow the science. Which science? I mean, if scientists have good data and they interpret it right, you'll get good advice. If they have good data, don't interpret it right, you're going to get bad advice. If you've got bad data, it doesn't matter how they interpret it, you're not going to get good advice. If there's a political agenda, oh, that'll never happen. Why do we think that politicians and other people in power are, are immune to the three temptations the rest of us are not immune to? What are the three things that can destroy your life just like that if used improperly? Sex, money, and power. Those are the three things that can trip any of us up. Why? Because sex, money, and power are good things. In fact, they're so good, we'll often take shortcuts to get them. And if there's a sex, money, or power motive, it may cloud the way people interpret the data. If there's money to be made, if there's power to be had, people might, and if other people are being shut up who have a contrary view, well, that's telling us something, isn't it? You gotta shut the other people up? When these people are scientists too, something else is going on. Same thing is true in the, in the debate between the creationists and the, or the intelligent design people and the evolutionists. You know, everyone's looking at the same data, but some people say it's an intelligent designer that brought us here. Other people say, no, it's natural law. Do you know there's only two possibilities? It's either a natural cause or an intelligent cause. There's no other possible cause. But some people have ruled out in, uh, intelligent causes before they look at the evidence. Is it any wonder they always conclude it's got to be a natural cause? Now, maybe they're right, but if you're ruling out the only other possibility, maybe you're not right. Maybe science doesn't say anything. Scientists say things. And by the way, as important as science is, and as wonderful as it is, it makes our lives better, live longer, all that, it's not the most important thing in our lives. Honey, do you love me? Yeah, why? I don't know, let's run an experiment. No, that's not the way life works, all right? Oh, this is the big one too. You ought not judge. Christians, don't judge. Jesus said don't judge. Why are you judging, you hypocrites? All right, let's leave Jesus aside for just a second. What's the logical problem with this? Yeah, if somebody says you ought not judge, you might want to say, hey, isn't that a judgment? Or you might want to say, if we're not to judge, why are you judging me for judging? Now, by the way, didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope, never said it. Sure he did. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. It's right in the middle of his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. All right, I know this is going to sound weird, but it's true. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. Do you think when Matthew was writing his biography, we now call a gospel, he said, here's chapter 7, verse 1. No, when were the chapter and verse divisions added? 
about 500 years ago to help us navigate the text, which is really important. Because without numbers, it'd be really hard to find your way around this big uh, series of books. I mean, imagine you go to church one Sunday morning, you're there with your Bible, you don't have numbers in your Bible, the pastor doesn't have numbers in his, and he just looks at you and he goes, let's go about two-thirds of the way in, let's see if we can find the same spot. No, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to do that. You'd need numbers to navigate. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can make it say whatever we want. This is why, and by the way, this, you're, some of you are going to ha hate me for this, but I'm leaving tomorrow, so it doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> this is why I always ask people who quote Jeremiah 29, 11, as if it applies to them. Have you read the context of the passage? You know Jeremiah 29, 11? I mean, this is on pillows. This is on posters. This is on birthday cards. This is on coffee mugs. You know all the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope in a future. Who's that written to? Is that written to 21st century Christians? No, that's written to the exiles who were forcibly taken out of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. He took them to modern day Iraq and God wrote them and said through Jeremiah and said, I'm gonna prosper you 70 years from now. Just sit tight up there, seek the welfare of, the, of your community. It doesn't apply to us, it's not a promise to us. I always ask people who quote Jeremiah 29, 11, as if, it pro as if it's a promise to us today, why don't you quote Jeremiah 44, 11? What's Jeremiah 44, 11? That's what God promised to do to the exiles that went to Egypt, and God warned them, don't go to Egypt. You know what Jeremiah 44, 11 says? I will destroy you and all Judah. You don't see that stitched into a pillow. <laughs> you don't see that on a birthday card, happy birthday. I will destroy you and all Judah. <laughs> that is so sweet, Grandma. Thank you so much. No. Because we're taking stuff out of context, and we can't take Matthew 7, 1 out of context either. What does the whole passage say? It says, judge not, lest you be judged by the same standard you judge others, you be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the log out of your own eye first, you hypocrite, which is a judgment. Then you'll be better able to help your brother. And then he goes on to talk about don't cast your pearls before swine, which is another judgment. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying, get that problem out of your life first so you can better help your brother. So this is not a command not to judge. It's actually a command on how to judge. In other words, don't judge hypocritically. If you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. But it would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Number one, it's a judgment itself. Number two, you'd be dead already if you didn't make judgments. You made 100 judgments just today getting over here. Right? Good choices from bad choices. Safe choices from dangerous choices. And now you're going, this was a bad judgment. This guy's crazy. Why am I here? Right? Everybody makes judgments. Atheists make judgments. They judge there's no God. Bible's not telling the truth. There's no objective meaning to life. There's no hope. These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? I will say this, though. Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental and who were the judgmental ones in his day pharisees and who were the pharisees what was their job they were the religious and political leaders of israel many of them were on the sanhedrin that's the jewish ruling council to whom rome delegated much of the day-to-day -day law lawmaking authority too these people were the politicians and jesus went after these people are you telling me jesus got involved in politics yes and he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus makes a whip, and he goes and he jacks people up in the temple. Sweet and gentle Jesus did this? Yes! And then in, in John chapter 8, he's having an argument with these politicians, these Pharisees. And he's right in the middle of the argument with them. And he says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Excuse me, I am Christ. <laughs> Imagine you're having an argument with somebody. and You stop right in the middle and you go, your father is the devil. Never try that with a sibling, by the way. And then in Matthew 23, Jesus is again going after these guys, these Pharisees, these religious politicians. And he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. 
You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney. Can't we all get along, boys and girls? No! I came to bring a sword. It's going to divide mother and daughter, father and son. How many times have you ever heard anyone preach on that passage? And many of you in this room know that verse is true. Why? Because some of you are divided in your own family over Jesus. It's true. Look, Jesus was tough. In fact, why did they kill Jesus? Number one, he spoke truth to power, particularly the temple authorities, who wanted him dead. Why? Because if Jesus succeeded, they were out of a job. In fact, I think Caiaphas, the high priest, knew Jesus was the Messiah. Right after he raises Lazarus from the dead, you know what Caiaphas says? It's better that one innocent man die than the whole nation perish. Sex, money, power. Caiaphas didn't want to give up his power. Second reason he was killed, he claimed to be God. That's sedition to the Romans and blasphemy to the Jews. So he was tough. He was killed, certainly not for going around saying, love your neighbor. That doesn't get you killed. But you claim to be God. You speak truth to power. There's going to be trouble. By the way, I've noticed one other thing about judging. You ever notice that when you compliment somebody, which is a judgment, nobody gets upset? You know, if you say to your best friend, I really love you. You're such a wonderful person. I wish I could be like you. You think your friend's going to say, well, who are you to judge? <laughs> you think you're worse than me? No one's going to say that, right? I've noticed that people don't have a problem with judging. They just have a problem with judgments they don't like. In fact, if you tell somebody something that's true and they get upset with you, you just helped convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. For you military people in here, and by the way, I was in the Navy for eight years, which stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> for you military people in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. If you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. As Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. So don't buy into this idea you can't make judgments. You have to make judgments. You just can't be judgmental about it because nobody in this room is going to make it to heaven because you're better than somebody else. The only way any of us are going to make it is because of what Jesus did for us. If, in fact, he really did rise from the dead, and we're going to get there. Now, we could talk about many more of these, but we've got to move on. Can everyone see? I just want to sum it up. Can everyone see that this statement right here shoots itself? Can everybody see that? And all the other statements we just mentioned shoot themselves. You ought not judge. All truth comes from science. There's no truth, there's no the truth, only might. These are all self-defeating, which means relativism and postmodernism are false because they claim it's true that there is no truth. Now, tragically, many of our universities and high schools have bought into postmodernism. Why would you pay thousands of dollars to go to a school where they tell you the truth that there is no truth? Why? Now, a little bit later, we're going to set up the microphone for Q&A, and I might ask you a question if you're not a Christian. It's not fair for me to do that unless I warn you in advance. Uh, this is actually a picture from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and they love the Bible there about as much as the University of California at Berserkley does. And um, anyway, um, I may ask you a question, and here's the question I might ask. And if, you're, if you're, you are Christian and you want other people to be Christians, I recommend you ask this question. Here it is. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no. No. How's that reasonable? How's that rational? I ask you if something were true, would you believe it? And you say no. It's not rational. The problem isn't in the head. The problem's in the heart. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because often they want to be God of their own lives. They're not on a truth quest. They're on a happiness quest. And this is even true of many Christians. 
We're not following Jesus. We just want to make ourselves happy. And you can make yourself happy over the short term, doing a lot of fun, selfish things. But over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in this room who's over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves. We're going to try for happiness doing it my selfish way. Now, not, not going to work long term. Short term, yeah. Long term, no. So always ask people, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If they hesitate or say no, it's not a head problem, it's a heart problem. They don't want it to be true. So I just want to let you know I may ask you that question, so think about it, all right? Now, truth does exist. The only question is, or the next question is, is it true that God exists? And I mentioned three arguments we're going to look at. Here's the first argument for the existence of God. It comes from the beginning of the universe known as the cosmological argument. Now, cosmological just comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. It says if the universe had a beginning, then it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in you, life, there must be a designer. Now, these two arguments have some scientific evidence behind them. We'll see some of that here in a minute. The third argument isn't science related at all, yet it's the argument you've all known since you were a very small child. It's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says that there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one. Like it's wrong to murder six million people in a Holocaust. Or it's wrong to walk into a school and murder nine-year-olds. Then there has to be a God, why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then everything's just a matter of opinion. That's just your opinion against Hitler's opinion or your opinion against whoever shot those kids up yesterday. That's not just a matter of opinion. We know those things are really wrong. If they're really wrong, there must be a standard of really right that we're obligated to obey. That's God's nature. If he doesn't exist, nothing's right or wrong. We'll get to that later, but we got to start here. Now, you got to admit it was worth coming out here tonight just to see God do that. <laughs> Some of you said, I've never seen God move, or really? Check this out. <laughs> now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big... Now, I know there's some Christians in here going, uh, Frank, you know, we're Christians in here, and uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. <laughs> in fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheists are admitting the evidence for it. Stephen Hawking, who was probably the top physicist in the world until he died about five years ago. As you know, Hawking for many years had ALS. He was kind of a medical miracle. Normally ALS will kill you in two years. He had it for like 40. Anyway, here's what Hawking said, an atheist. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, Hawking tried to come up with another explanation other than God. He failed, but he's admitting the data that space, time, and matter literally had a beginning out of nothing. Once there was nothing, and then the universe came into existence. Now, what's nothing? Aristotle had a good definition of nothing. He said, nothing is what rocks dream about. <laughs> That's nothing. No space, no matter, no time. Then the universe came into existence. This uh, Russian cosmologist by the name of Alexander Vilenkin, he's an agnostic. He actually wrote this about all the evidence for the beginning. He said, with the proof now in place, cosmologist, by the way, a cosmologist is not someone that puts on your makeup. The cosmologist studies the universe. Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, two interesting words here. The word proof. Why is that unusual for a scientist to use? Because science, by definition, is tentative. There's often new evidence that comes in that overturns a previous theory. In fact, I know you can't trust everything on Wikipedia, but you know Wikipedia has a page called like, something like overturned theories in science. There's almost 100 of them because new evidence comes in. But you know what Vilenkin's saying? He said, I see so much evidence pointing to one conclusion. I'm going to call it a proof that the universe had a beginning out of nothing. Also, the interesting word problem. Why is it a problem? 
if the universe had a beginning? Because if it had a beginning, if nature had a beginning, what could have created nature? Can't be a natural cause. There are no natural causes. Nature doesn't exist. It must be something beyond nature, something we would call supernature. We'll get to that here in a minute. Now, we're not going to go through the evidence for this. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book, chapter three. And number three, it's not controversial. Even the atheists are admitting it. What is controversial is not that the universe had a beginning, but what caused the universe to have a beginning. That's what's controversial, so let's take a look. Let's jump to the bottom line. Seems to me if the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. We got two options, either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? That no one created something out of nothing or someone created something out of nothing? What do you think? Do you realize there are some atheists now saying that no one created something out of nothing? Which view takes more faith? Do you realize everyone believes in at least one miracle? Christians believe in this miracle and many others. But atheists believe in at least one miracle. At least some of them are saying no one created something out of nothing. Now, which takes more faith? That no one or someone did the miracle? Now you say, where did the someone come from? Well, ladies and gentlemen, if space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing, as all the evidence seems to suggest, whatever created space, time, and matter can't be made of space, time, and matter. In other words, must transcend space, time, and matter. In other words, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create. Why personal? Because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice and only persons can make choices. The cause would also have to be intelligent to have a mind to make a choice. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, how do you know it's the Christian God, Frank? We don't. Yet, this could be Allah or some other theistic or deistic God. But if we keep going through the evidence all the way into the New Testament, I think we're going to realize that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,990 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. We haven't gotten there yet, but we've got six attributes for the first cause that suspiciously look like the God of the Bible. Let's go to the next argument. Oh, before we do, we've got to ask a question. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? You say, well, who made God? Let's go back to this for a second. If space, time, and matter had a beginning, the cause must be spaceless, timeless. If you're timeless, do you have a beginning? No, God is the uncaused first cause. God didn't have a beginning. There has to be an uncaused first cause. It's either the universe or something outside the universe. The evidence shows the universe had a beginning, so it must be something outside the universe. Now, let's go on to the teleological argument. And there's two aspects to this. The design argument, the universe appears to be designed, and you appear to be designed. Let's start with the universe first. Scientists have discovered in recent decades that the universe is fine-tuned. That if you were to change any one of a number of factors virtually imperceptibly about our universe, either the universe wouldn't exist at all, or if it did, no life could exist in it. And even atheists admit this. Stephen Hawking again, here's what he said about the initial uh, expansion speed of the universe. He said if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. If the expansion rate was that infinitesimally different from the very beginning, none of us would be here. Now, you can't make any sort of evolutionary explanation for this. You can't say, well, maybe it evolved by chance, whatever that means. Why? Because this is the initial condition. It started there. Seems to me the same being that created space, time, and matter is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be. Also, the gravitational force, if it were altered by more than 1 in 10 to the 40th power compared to the strong nuclear force, we wouldn't exist. What's one part in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I. Let me give you an illustration. 
take the entire North American continent and pile it in dimes all the way to the moon. That's like 238,000 miles. And then do that on a billion other North American continents. And then take all those dimes, put them in one pile, mark one red, mix it in, blindfold a friend, throw them in that pile, ask him to pick a dime. The chances that he would pick that one red dime are one chance in 10 to the 40th power. Is he going to pick that dime? No. No. You say, well, maybe chance caused this. Ladies and gentlemen, is chance a cause? Does chance cause things? Who caused this? Chance. He was just here. No. <laughs> chance is not a cause. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. You know what scientists mean when they use the word chance? What they mean is, we don't know. Look, there's only two possible explanations for that value being where it is. Either it was designed to be there or it wasn't. What makes more sense? Somebody designed it. And there's like a dozen of these. Any change, any one of, the, any one of them, we don't exist. In fact, atheists admit this is probably their hardest argument to answer. And it's not just the universe that appears to be designed. Our solar system appears to be designed with us in mind. Let's take a look at our solar system right here. Here we are, a third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is? That's a lie. It's way too cold here in the winter. <laughs> the axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees. Change that slightly, we don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours, change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us, change that slightly, we don't exist. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here on Earth. Why? What does Jupiter do for us? Its gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, you know what these dark marks are? They're comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. Because <laughs> if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. In fact, you want to see the planets by size? There you go. You got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. <laughs> and what if Pluto identifies as a planet? <laughs> you bigots. <laughs> Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun over here. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto? Forget about it. <laughs> All right, keep an eye on Arcturus now. Where's Arcturus now? Way over here. See it way over here? See it way over there? That's Antares. That's another star in our galaxy. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible, Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here, look, I don't name the stars, okay? <laughs> if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. The heavens are awesome. And this is just in our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles. And all that distance is necessary for us to exist here on Earth. Now, how far is 30 trillion miles? Far. It'll take you at least two tanks of gas on a Toyota Prius <laughs> to go 30 trillion miles. Do you know when the space shuttle was in orbit? Remember the space shuttle we used to put up there? It used to go around the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to school in the morning? <laughs> Take the space shuttle. Five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation and try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go five miles a second to go from our star, the sun, to another star inside our galaxy an average distance away 30 trillion miles. How long do you think it would take us? 
Anyone? A long time. You must be a math major. Ball State's known for this. It would take us 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away inside our galaxy, you've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years, you would be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going anywhere in space. It took us nine years to get to Pluto. Nine years. In fact, if our solar system was the size of a quarter and the sun was a speck of dust in the middle of the quarter and Pluto's on the outer rim, you know what the next nearest star is? It's two football fields away. We're not going anywhere. How vast is this universe? Is if this is just in our galaxy. Well, notice what the psalmist says. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. How high are the heavens above the earth? If these are the kind of distances in our galaxy. Well, the Hubble Space Telescope helped us discover that. I don't know if you can see this here. Look along the bottom of this slide. You see these are mountains down here. Can you see that? Okay. This is the, uh, the southern hemisphere. What I'm about to show you is something that we did with the Hubble tel Space Telescope about 20 years ago. It's called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. We trained the Hubble Space Telescope on one 26 millionth of the sky. What's one 26 millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up. That piece of rice represents about one 26 millionth of the sky. So they trained Hubble on this spot for like 11 days of exposure time. I'm about to show you what they found. You can Google this. It's in the public domain. Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's a little video they put together. There's no audio, just video. It's a short video. You guys ready? You're going to see the constellations come up, then Hubble's going to zoom out to 1 26 millionth of the sky. Here we go. There are the constellations. Let's see what Hubble found. What you're looking at are nearly 10,000 galaxies in one 26 millionth of the sky. Each of these galaxies has billions of stars of their own. Now you know what the Bible means when it says the heavens declare the glory of God. In fact, if you find this many stars in one twenty-six millionth of the sky, how many stars are there in the entire universe? The number of stars in the entire universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches, on all the earth, times... 100,000. And to go from just one star to another star, just in our galaxy, going five miles a second, will take you over 200,000 years. This is a problem. What's a problem? Because if the vastness of the heavens are supposed to communicate to us the infinity of God, which is what the scripture says, we're in trouble because God is infinitely just. And if he's infinitely just and we get justice, none of us are going to make it. But he's not merely infinitely just. He's also infinitely loving. In fact, here's the second half of the verse I showed you a couple minutes ago. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. He's not only infinitely just, he's also infinitely loving. So how does he remove our transgressions from us? None of us can pay for our own inequities because we're fallen. So what does he do? He adds humanity to his deity 
He comes to earth. He allows the creatures that rebelled against him to torture and kill him so he could remain just and yet justify us. This is why Jesus is the only way. It's not an arbitrary claim. He's not just saying, I'm God, I said so. No, because there's no other way an infinitely just being can allow unjust creatures like me and you to go unpunished unless he punishes an innocent substitute in our place. Where's he going to find an innocent substitute? Not in any of us. We're all fallen. He's got to come to earth and do it himself. Now, when you look out at the universe and you realize that there are stars equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 Earths, and it's going to take you over 200,000 years just to go between two of those stars at five miles a second, does that make you feel insignificant? It shouldn't. Why? Because as amazing as the heavens are, they're not made in the image of God, but you are. In fact, the heavens were made for you. In fact, this is the second part of the teleological argument. You're designed. This is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? In fact, let's go back even further than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. <laughs> when your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States. <laughs> 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race. And you won. That's right. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. Now, seeing some of you limping here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool. But you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, and it contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You know, you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now. Your genetic information has just duplicated itself. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. These, those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, wait a minute, Frank. You can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this. This actually comes from the first book that Dr. Geist and I wrote, creatively titled Legislating Morality. <laughs> All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law that doesn't legislate morality. The only question is, Whose morality will we legislate? And when people say, don't impose your morality on me, you know what I often say? Why not? Would that be immoral? See, because you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots, but you're imposing that ought not on me. Why do you get to impose ought nots, but I don't? Or actually, the better answer is this. When somebody says, don't impose your morality on me, say this. This isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder is wrong, that abortion is wrong, that rape is wrong, that theft is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men. And the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. 
The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. So if you don't like the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For most of you, anyway. <laughs> Some cells became brain cells, others lung cells, others heart cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another, knock it off. I mean, are you thinking about this? You're going, wait a minute, Frank, I got to concentrate. New red blood cells coming up right now. No, this is just happening. How is it happening? Aristotle noticed something 2,400 years ago. Of course, he didn't know anything about blood cells, but he did notice that all of nature is going in a direction. For example, why does an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? And is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground thinking, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No. But if it's properly nourished, it reliably goes in the direction of becoming an oak tree. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, and it doesn't, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. This is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God, that all of nature is going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, there must be some mind directing it. Now notice, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the Big Bang cause way back when. This is a cause every single second the universe exists. It's a present right now cause. Yes, God created the universe, but he also created you and the natural laws that govern the universe. And every single second you exist and the natural laws exist, he's keeping it going. In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If a band were up here playing music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music. What would happen the second the band stopped playing? Music's over. God does the same thing. Creates the universe, creates you, creates the natural laws that govern the universe and keeps them going. And he sustains it every single second. If he were to pull his hand away, the universe would go out of existence. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, we can do science. Because science is a search for causes. And it relies on reliable natural laws that do the same thing over and over again. Without it, we couldn't do science. This is also why the Apostle Paul said, in Jesus, we live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. So God isn't just a creator, he's also a sustainer. Now, there's much more on that argument in the Stealing from God book, but we got to move to our third argument here for God, and that is the moral argument. And maybe the best way to talk about this is to ask you this question. How do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six? That's when he throws it to the other team and they take it back for a touchdown. How do you know? This is the interactive portion of the program. How do you know? Why is that important? What do you have to know? What do you have to know? Not just the rules. What do you have to know? What's that? We've been told so, but told so, but what have we been told? We've been told there's a purpose to the game, right? There's a purpose to the game for you to score more points than the other team. And a touchdown takes you closer to that purpose. A pick six takes you further away. If there's no purpose to the game, then you can't say this is a good play and this is a bad play. And now notice in football, 
that the purpose of the game comes from outside the game. When the Chiefs and the Eagles played a couple of months ago in, in Arizona, they showed up, the field's all set, the refs are out there, they're not making up the rules. Where do the rules come from? They come from the commissioner and the owners, and every once in a while they tweak the rules a little bit, right? But the rules come from outside the game. Now, in football, the rules are arbitrary. They could be different. In life, the rules are not arbitrary. They come from the creator of the game, and he says, this is the right way to live, because here's the purpose of living, and this is the wrong way to live. Don't go in this direction, because he gives us a purpose. What's our ultimate purpose? To know God and to make him known. Do you realize if there's no purpose, you can't say this is good and this is bad? In fact, if there's no God, the Nazis were not wrong. That's just your opinion if there's no God. If there's no God, love is no better than rape. Oh, you might like love better, but that's just your preference. If there is no God, there are no human rights. Do you realize in our country we seem to be creating rights every 10 minutes? But if there's no God, there's no right to anything. Even on the controversial issues, there's not only no right to same-sex marriage, there's no right to natural marriage if there's no God. There's not only no right to abortion, there's no right to life. There's no right to anything unless God exists. It's just your opinion. And our founders recognized this because they started our nation with, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created and endowed by their government. No, it doesn't say that. Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And governments are instituted among men to secure these rights. If the government isn't secure in rights, Jefferson and his cohort said, we have a right to a new government. In fact, if there is no God, murder, slavery, and racism are not wrong. But we all know they are wrong. So there must be a standard outside of ourselves. I ask anyone in this room, if you're a moral relativist, you're going to tell me that the murder of six people, three of them nine-year-olds, yesterday was just a matter of opinion? It's not morally different than wearing white after Labor Day? If there is no God, religious people have never done anything wrong. And if you're a Christian in here, you may have been, in fact, you may have been called a hypocrite. You know what somebody calls you a hypocrite? You know what you ought to say? You're right. If I wasn't a hypocrite, if I was perfect, I wouldn't need a savior. How many people in this room either are not Christians or know people who are not Christians because some Christians were jerks to them? Oh, yeah, look around the room. There's probably about half of us. Here's what I want you to ask a person who's not a Christian because other Christians have wronged them. And this comes from the historian John Dixon, who asked this question. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven. So when somebody plays Jesus poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Jesus. Look, just because I'm not true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. Don't look at me. I'm not perfect. Jesus is. Newsflash, Christianity is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. So ask people, when somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? And by the way, if they call you a hypocrite, you ought to say, yeah, I am. And you've just given evidence for God. Why? Because what's wrong with hypocrisy if there's no God? That's just your opinion. And I would submit to you, the person calling you a hypocrite doesn't even live up to their own standards, do they? Much less God's. If there is no God, tolerance is no better than intolerance. Ladies and gentlemen, are Christians commanded to be tolerant? Watch how you answer. No. Tolerance is too weak. Tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. Christians are commanded to love. Love says reach out and help them. And in order to love people, sometimes you can't tolerate what they do. In fact, let me ask you a question here. How many people in here are parents? How many parents do we have in here? All right, how many people in here are former children? All right, all right, good, good. So we, all, we all should be able to get this. If your parent tolerated everything you want to do as a child, was that parent loving? No, that parent needed to stand in the way of evil if they truly did love you. 
Love does not mean approval. Love means standing in the way of evil. In fact, this is what the Apostle Paul says. In the chapter, everyone reads at their wedding, but nobody obeys. 1 Corinthians 13, love always protects. Love rejoices in the truth. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Love always perseveres. If you truly love somebody, you'll stand in the way of evil. You won't approve of what they do. You know, the great economist, uh, Thomas Sowell, who was brought up in Harlem, but somehow taught himself to read, got a PhD, and taught at some of the greatest schools in the country. He's now 92 years old. And here's what Sowell said. He said, when you tell people what they need to hear, you're helping them. When you tell people what they want to hear, you're helping yourself. Why don't you tell people in your life in a nice way that they're about to walk off a cliff? You know why you don't? Because you're protecting yourself. Because you don't want them to be mad at you. When you tell them the truth, you're helping them, but you're going to take some of their abuse. That's what love does. If there is no God, you can't complain about the problem of evil. And every college campus I go to, someone will say, if there's a good God, how can there be evil? Actually, the only way there can be evil is if there's a good God. In fact, C.S. Lewis thought there was too much evil in the world, so there, can't, there couldn't be a good God. He went to World War I. He saw his own friend die in World War I. He said, there can't be a good God. There's too much injustice in the world. Then one day he realized his argument didn't work, and he wrote it in the book Mere Christianity. Here's what he said. He said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what injustice was unless you knew what justice was. Something can't be not right unless something is right. In other words, evil presupposes good, but good presupposes God. In fact, you can look at it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you've got to have sunshine. Oh, you can have shadow, or you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have shadows without sunshine. You can't have evil without good. You say, well, how can this be? Because evil is a lack in a good thing. It's a parasite. It doesn't exist on its own. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the, all the cancer out of a good body, you got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? You got nothing. Evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You got a pinto. Okay. It doesn't exist on its own. You get the idea. So if evil exists, good exists. But if good exists in an objective way, then God exists. I know that sounds counterintuitive. But if evil exists, God exists. Not because God is doing evil, but because he's the standard of good, which allows us to even know what evil is. You see, evil doesn't disprove God. It may prove there's a devil out there, but it doesn't disprove God. It actually shows that God does exist. So when Christopher Hitchens, by the way, you guys know who Christopher Hitchens was? He was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. <laughs> and uh, I debated him a couple of times years ago. You can see the debates on our YouTube channel. This is a picture from our second debate at the College of New Jersey. He wrote, God is not great. How religion poisons everything. Now, he has it exactly backwards. Religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. I poison religion. Why? Because I don't live up to the pure words of Christ. But if I could, I wouldn't need them. If I was perfect, do you realize you can get to heaven by being good? You can. You just got to be perfect your whole life. Too late for me. How about you? Okay, so I said to Christopher at the debate, I said, Christopher, I can't live up to what Jesus told me to live up to. I can't be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. But if I could, I wouldn't need him. In fact, I said, I'm a hypocrite. And when people say... I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there. I always say, come on down, pal. We got room for one more. Because <laughs> the church is full of hypocrites. It's a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. It's, it's, that's what church is all about. 
trying to become more like Jesus and learning more about Jesus. Now, let's sum up these three arguments. What do we learn from these three arguments? From the cosmological argument, we see the first cause is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. From the teleological argument, we get more evidence he's intelligent. We also see that he's sustaining the universe. And from the moral argument, we can see this being is also moral, is loving, is just. Now, ladies and gentlemen, think about this. From these three arguments, we say, we can see there's a cause out there that's spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent, who created and sustains the universe and is moral and just. This is the God of biblical Christianity, and we haven't even opened the Bible yet. This is called natural theology. You don't need scriptures to know that God exists. But we don't know if this is the God of the Bible. Could just be a generic theistic or deistic God. How would we know? For that, we got to go to the third question, are miracles possible? Now, you're probably looking at your watch going, Frank, you're running out of time here. How are you going to cover it? The third one doesn't take long. Miracles are used to show someone that a particular person speaks for God. That's what they were used in the Bible for. Moses spoke for God, so Moses could do miracles. Jesus spoke for God, so Jesus could do miracles. The problem is in today's culture, people think miracles are impossible, like Noah. Hey, Christians, you Christians in here, can we just agree on one thing? Noah and the ark is crazy. Please, it's crazy. I already asked you, has anyone ever seen a resurrection? Nobody raised their hand. Yet for you to be a Christian, you have to believe some of us, you have to believe something none of us have ever seen. And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a tale of a whale or a whale of a tail? I mean, what's the deal with Jonah? Can you really believe in Jonah? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? No, the resurrection is easy compared to the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle in the Bible is... I got some of you a second time. Yeah. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible. Now, here's the interesting thing. The atheists are admitting the evidence for the first verse. Look, if Genesis 1-1 is true, if God can create the universe out of nothing, can he do the Noah miracle? Of course it's crazy, unless God exists. Can he raise Jesus from the dead? Of course he can. If he can create the whole universe out of nothing, can he walk on water? Can he do the Jonah miracle? Can he make axe heads float in water? Can he turn water into wine? He can do any of these things if he actually can create the universe out of nothing. And when people tell me I don't believe in miracles, I often say, well, look around. You're living in one. This whole universe is a miracle. Now, there's just a couple of things we got to deal with before we move on to the next step. And that is some people say they won't believe in miracles because they've never seen one. That's not a good reason to disbelieve something. Why? Because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. You believe in your mind. Have you ever seen it? You're using it right now. You believe in the laws of logic, the laws of mathematics. You ever seen those? No, you're using them right now. You believe in justice. Have you ever seen justice? No, it's not something you see. You may have seen people treated justly or unjustly, or you may have done that. But you don't see it in itself because it's an immaterial virtue grounded in the nature of God. You've never seen love. And everyone in here believes in love. You don't see it. You may have loved someone or been loved, but you don't see it. It's not something you see. In fact, in uh, the second debate with Hitchens at the College of New Jersey, a student in the audience asked Christopher this question. Christopher, what is love? And Christopher, being a materialist, had to come up with a materialistic answer because he doesn't believe in immaterial reality. He thinks everything's made of molecules. He thinks you're nothing but a moist robot. All right? So love couldn't exist then. So finally, after he hemmed and hawed for a while, he finally said, love is a chemical. And I said, don't tell that to your wife. <laughs> Honey, do you love me? Yeah. Why? Because I got the chemical today. You know, tomorrow I might not have it. No, love is not a chemical. It's grounded in the nature of God. It's an action. Uh, you've never seen gravity. Oh, Frank, there it is right there. No, you're not seeing gravity. What are you seeing? You're seeing the effects of gravity. By the way, this is how you know that God exists. 
If someone ever asks you, how do you know that God exists? I think you ought to say this. I know God because I believe in the law of cause and effect. And I see his effects all around us. I'm reasoning from effect back to cause. If there's a creation, the cosmological argument, that's the effect I'm reasoning back to a cause, a creator. If there's design in the universe and design in life, you, the teleological argument, that's the effect I'm reasoning back to a cause, a designer. If there's a moral law written on your heart, the moral argument, that's the effect I'm reasoning back to a cause, a moral lawgiver. If I have the ability to reason, to use these laws of logic and to, to understand truths outside my skull, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause of mind. If there's evidence a man predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause. Who could raise somebody from the dead? Only God. So you're always reasoning from effect to cause. This is what scientists do. They're trying to discover what particular cause caused a particular effect. And what is the queen of all sciences? No, it's not physics, you materialists. The queen of all sciences is theology. Because theology takes all academic disciplines and puts them under one rubric of truth. That's why when you come to university, you're supposed to find unity in diversity. But too often, we don't teach that anymore. We teach people to be experts in one small sliver of life. And it prevents us from seeing the big picture. You've never seen George Washington. Yet you believe he existed. Why? Because he's left effects behind that are best explained by a man who lived from 1732 to 1799, George Washington. You've never seen Jesus in the flesh either. But there's evidence that he's left effects behind that are best explained by Jesus of Nazareth. So you're always reasoning from effect to cause. Now, miracles do not need to happen today for Christianity to be true. There could be no miracles since the first century and Christianity would still be true if those miracles actually occurred. I think miracles have occurred since then. In fact, Craig Keener, who's an amazing researcher at Asbury Seminary in Kentucky, wrote a hernia-inducing two-volume set called Miracles in modern day. But even if he's wrong, Christianity is still true if miracles occurred in the first century. You know what has to be true for atheism to be true? Every single miracle claim and spiritual experience in the history of the world has to be false. Is that possible? That's possible, but not reasonable. Now, one last thing about miracles. People say, well, I haven't seen miracles, so I can't believe in them. You know, if miracles do occur today, you ought not expect to see a lot of them. Why? Because they have to be rare to get our attention. If miracles are occurring all the time, we wouldn't consider them miracles. We'd say, this stuff happens all the time. I mean, imagine if people rose from the dead routinely. <laughs> what would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? I mean, you go to somebody, you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle George just rose from the dead two weeks ago. <laughs> now I got to give the inheritance back, right? <laughs> no, it's got to be a rare event. It can't be a regular event if it's going to get our attention. By the way, there are regular events that occur every day, and in our hearts we know they're virtually miraculous. We know that there's intelligence behind them. In fact, how many people in this room have ever seen your own flesh and blood born? Every mother should raise your hand and any father who is in the room. Now, when you see your own flesh and blood come out of a person, you don't go, evolution, <laughs> right? Right here, you go, this is amazing. What a great baby, by the way. This baby has been sitting here hearing me rant and rave and hasn't made a peep. How old is that baby? Two months? Does the baby sleep at night? She does. You must be a Christian. God, God must love you more. <laughs> okay? It's a miracle. See, you guys have to believe in miracles now. Two-month-old baby sleeps through the night and sleeps through me. All right, let's go on now to the final question. And that is, we know, first of all, that truth exists, that God exists, that miracles are possible if our reasoning is good to this point. Now the only question is, is the New Testament telling the truth about the central miracle in Christianity, and that is the resurrection. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. Now, in the book, we have 10 reasons to believe the New Testament writers have told the truth. We don't have time for that tonight. 
I'm only going to talk briefly about two of them. The first is something called embarrassing stories. Why embarrassing stories? Historians know if there's something embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why? Because you're not going to invent things that embarrass you. You might invent things that make you look good, but you won't invent things that make you look bad. In fact, let me ask you guys a question. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? If you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying <laughs> to make yourself look good. And it's not working. We know you're lying. <laughs> All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? You don't lie to make yourself look bad. You won't lie to embarrass yourself. You might lie to make yourself look good, but not embarrass yourself. Well, the New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories that they never would have invented. That's why we call this the duh factor. They're not making this up. Let me just give you a few of them. Peter, their leader, is called Satan by Jesus. Do you think they invented this? Do you think Mark, who wrote this down at one point, said to Peter, Hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. <laughs> what do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. <laughs> look, I'm the leader here. This doesn't look good. And then Peter says, Oh, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He denies him three times. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away for fear of the Jews. This is like a Monty Python movie. Run away, right? They all run away. And who are the brave ones? Ladies, ladies, who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. That's right, ladies. You can give yourselves a hand. That's right. I am woman. Hear me roar. I didn't run away like you sissy pants man did. Now, who wrote the New Testament documents down? Men. Now, what man is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews while the women went down to discover the empty tomb. Would any man in here invent that? I mean, if I was there, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? I'd say, like, we marched right down there and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. Yeah, that sounds good. John said, get out. Peter, roundhouse kicked him. Thomas said, we'll be back. No doubt. And then on Sunday morning, we march right down to the tomb, and I overpowered that elite Roman guard, and we saw Jesus, who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. I would never say it was Mr. Sissy Pants why the women went down to discover the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? Forget about the fact it was embarrassing to men. It was, but independent of that, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses? Because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four Gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were, as embarrassing as it was. In fact, one of them is a formerly demon-possessed woman. Gee, what a credible witness you got there, huh? No, they're not making this up. I actually had a lady come up to me once, and she said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. <laughs> I said, that is an excellent point. Because, <laughs> ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? <laughs> there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what happened? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. The nuke blew up. I've been hot for three days. <laughs> What's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next verse is in the New Testament, but it is. You know the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the biography of Matthew. This is the climax. This is Matthew 28, the Great Commission, where Jesus takes his disciples up on the hill in Galilee, and he's given them the Great Commission. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers. He says make disciples. Anyway... He's standing there, giving them the Great Commission, the climax of the, of the gospel, and it says of the disciples who were standing there watching him, some believed, but some doubted. What? <laughs> He's standing resurrected right in front of them, and they're going, you see that guy over there? Yep, that guy over there is Jesus. Oh, no, it can't be. Jesus just killed long, not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. Look, Jesus is dead. It can't be him. It's him. 
Do you know what the Romans did to him? They whipped him. They nailed him to a cross. They put a spear in his side. Blood and water came out. I'm telling you, Jesus is dead. It's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? <laughs> the women told me. <laughs> They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus. His own family thinks he's out of his mind, Mark chapter 3. They want to seize him and take him home because they think he's nuts. His own brothers don't believe in him. Now, how many people in here have a brother? All right, how many have a brother who thinks he's God? Yeah, you don't believe in him either. <laughs> Neither did Jesus' brothers. He's called demon-possessed. You think they made that up? He's called a madman. He's called a drunkard. He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, notice there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. Who are they? Rahab and Tamar. Do you think Matthew, when he put those names in there, he said, you know what, I really think I ought to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in there. What do you say? Rahab, Tamar. No! In fact, there's a lot of shady people in the bloodline. Judah, from where we get the term Jew from? Jesus from the tribe of Judah? Not a good guy. Jesus is the brother that sold his other brother, his youngest brother, Joseph, into slavery in Egypt. And he's in the bloodline of the Messiah. David. David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess there's hope for the rest of us then, huh? Bathsheba's in there. In fact, when Matthew gets to her in the genealogy, he doesn't mention her name. What does he say instead? Uriah's wife. He's telling the truth, but it's a slam, right? Who's Uriah? Husband of Bathsheba, whom David had killed so he could have Bathsheba. They're not making this up. You go to any other you go to any other world history like this, nobody's make, no one is going to make themselves look so bad. In fact, Dennis Prager, some of you know who Dennis Prager is? Conservative Jewish man. He says, I know the, New, the Old Testament's true because the Jews would never invent themselves to look so bad. My question for Dennis is this. If the principle of embarrassment works for the Old Testament, why doesn't it work for the New? Same thing, right? And then Jesus is hung on a tree. And you don't do that if you're making a Messiah to the Jews. Why? Because according to Deuteronomy 21, 23, anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. They wouldn't accept that. Well, Jesus was under God's curse. What curse? The curse of sin. We put him under. But if you were making this up, you wouldn't say this. In fact, notice there are two trees in, in Genesis. What are the two trees? Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go all the way to the end of Revelation. By the way, the Bible is very symmetrical. What tree do you find in Revelation? Tree of life. You know there's a tree in the middle? What's the tree in the middle? It's the tree Jesus was hung on. Because we sinned at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only way we're going to gain access, because God is infinitely just, to the tree of life is if Jesus is hung on the tree in our place. But if you're making this up, you would never say this. It's not an invented story. There's a lot more in the books on this, but we got to go one more, and that is excruciating deaths. And this is the argument that says that these men who were in a position to know whether Jesus had resurrected from the dead or not died excruciating deaths when they could have saved themselves by saying, look, it never happened. Now, you got to keep in mind, these were all Jews. The only, the only Gentile writer, non-Jew, is Luke. Everybody else is a Jew. They already think they're God's chosen people. And two things they didn't think could happen. Number one, a man could claim to be God. That would be blasphemy. And they didn't think someone would rise from the dead in the middle of time. They knew everyone would rise from the dead at the end of time, according to Daniel 12. But they didn't think one guy would rise from the dead in the middle of time. So what would have these people saying, a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead? That that actually happened. In fact, think about it this way. What did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? What did they get by saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? They got kicked out of the synagogue, and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks. We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? First, we'll get kicked out of the synagogue, then we'll get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. 
what a great idea. No, I don't think so. In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. You know, I get this question. Are there any non-Christian writers that talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yes, they're listed in chapter 9 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. But they're not eyewitnesses. They corroborate some of the things that happen. But you know what's kind of underneath that question? You really can't trust the New Testament writers because, you see, these people were biased. They embellished it. You can only trust the non-Christian writers to figure out what happened. If you think about that for more than five seconds, you realize how stupid that is. Why? What did these people have to gain by, make, by saying it was true? Nothing. They had everything to lose temporally. If I'm going to trust anybody, it's going to be the people who had everything to lose, and yet they said it was true anyway. Those are the New Testament writers. Why would they die for a known lie? Now, at this point, you're probably going, time out, Frank. If you're going to say that martyrdom is evidence for Christianity, don't you have to say martyrdom is evidence for Islam? Because they have martyrs? And the answer is no. Why? Because there's a lot of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. But let me just give you one difference for our purposes here. The Muslim martyrs haven't witnessed anything that tells them that Islam is true. They just have faith. But the New Testament martyrs witnessed the resurrected Jesus. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. Some people will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody's going to die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. Now, last thing I'm going to say on this, and for those of you in here who think the Bible's inerrant like I do, this is going to sound like heresy, but it's not. Just stick with me. Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. You go, how can that be? Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Why? Because they witnessed the resurrected Jesus. They didn't read about it in a book. They saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. They verified he had risen from the dead. Now, thankfully, they decided to write it down so we could know about it and orient our lives according to it. But if they had never written it down, it still would have been true. We just wouldn't have known about it. In other words, Christianity did not originate with a book. Christianity originated with an event, the resurrection. There would be no book or series of books written by Jews in the first century claiming a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead unless a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead. In fact, we could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You wouldn't have these documents from the first century written by Jews who had everything to lose by saying it was true unless it really happened. Now, there's a lot more evidence. We just covered the first two. Here are some others, early sources, eyewitness details, embedded confirmation, expected predictions. That's Old Testament prophecy. Extra biblical writers, explosive growth of the church out of Jerusalem, which couldn't have happened if Jesus' body was in the tomb. Why? Because the Jews or the Romans could have just gone to the tomb and said, stop all this nonsense talk about the resurrection. He's dead. They couldn't do that because Jesus' tomb was empty. He was still using his body. What's the big picture? Does truth exist? If somebody says there's no truth, you're going to say, is that true? Uh, does God exist? First argument. Cosmological. Second. Teleological. Third. Moral argument. Are miracles possible? Greatest miracle in the Bible? Genesis 1.1. And even atheists are admitting the evidence for that. Uh, are they telling the truth about the resurrection? We only looked at two out of ten. Embarrassing testimonies, excruciating Embarrassing stories, excruciating testimony. It looks like they are. So, if you want to go further, we have some books on the book table and a couple of DVDs, too. I want to point out that all the proceeds from the sale of the books and the DVDs will go to feed needy children. Mine. <laughs> Just so you know, I need some help. But you don't necessarily have to write a book or buy a book because I want to send you the entire 
PowerPoint presentation that I just showed you. Actually, I'm going to send you the whole thing. The whole thing is 362 slides. I've showed you maybe 50. All right, so just text the word evidence to this phone number, 855-909-0582. 855-909-0582, and I'll send you the whole thing, plus about five other presentations. Also, uh, as I mentioned, the books and the DVDs are over there. We're now teaching online courses. Next week, I'm teaching a course on the essentials of Christianity. If you want to be a part of it, we still have a few seats available. Just go to crossexamine.org, click on online courses. You'll see it there. We'll do six live Zoom Q&A sessions together in addition to 17 hours of video. Also, uh, we're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. In fact, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media platform. We call it you twit face. Have you signed up for you twit face yet? <laughs> We're also on Instagram and TikTok, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget about the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast, wherever you get podcasts. We're on TV Wednesday nights. And if you don't do anything else, at least download the Cross Examined app. Two words in the App Store, Cross Examined. It not only has the podcast on there and streams the TV show, it has a quick answer section. So you might be having lunch with someone. You're a Christian and they say something that you don't know how to answer. They bring up an objection. All you need to do is take out your droid or your iPhone and go, hey, hang on, I'm getting a text. Hey, what about this? <laughs> Got it right there on the phone. All right? All right, last thing, it's true. So what? So what if it's true? What if, so what if Christianity is true? What's the big deal? Well, the greatest news of all, ladies and gentlemen, someone actually did die for you. Now, when I was in the Navy, I was in naval aviation, and it was fairly hard to earn golden wings, but not nearly as hard as earning a golden trident. That's what the SEALs earn. Very few people that start SEAL training make it through, perhaps 5%. Those that do make it through wear that trident with pride. It is their identity. When Michael Monsor was buried in San Diego, California, in Rosecrans Cemetery, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took off their tridents and pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that died for them, the one that sacrificed for them. That's what we're supposed to do. But no, our culture says, no, put your identity in your political party, or put your identity in your ethnic group, or put your identity in your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or your sexual orientation, or your gender identity, or put your identity in your bank account, or your vocation. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize none of those things are ultimate? That's a very weak foundation for an identity. If you put your identity in your job, what happens when you lose your job? You no longer have an identity? If you put your identity in your sexual preference, what happens when you're no longer sexually preferred? Or you can't perform anymore? You no longer have an identity? A friend of mine, she's 69 years old. She's on our board at crossexamine.org. She works at Starbucks, not for the money but to minister to young girls there. She was just there the other day. In the back is a young girl trying to transition to becoming a boy, so to speak. And all she did was flip through TikTok videos, trying to affirm that what she was doing was right. And my friend said to her, I made decisions when I was your age that I still regret. This is not the way to get an identity. You know, in Christianity, you don't achieve your identity. You receive your identity. It's free. If you have to achieve your identity, all the pressure's on you. And there's always someone that can do it better. You don't achieve it. You receive it. And it's eternal. This is why John said he has given you the right to become a child of God. You simply receive it. You don't achieve it. Tragically, we don't know the details yet, but what happened yesterday 
that girl was struggling with her identity. And everyone in this room, you know in your heart, that's not the way to get an identity. Yet our identity is in Christ who died for us and then also rose again. Now in just a minute, we're going to go to questions. But before we do, Joey, why don't you come on up here? Because there's about five different groups that put this event on. And for you students in particular, we want you to have a place you can go to further get into this material and learn about what Christianity is all about. So Joey, can you tell them about it a little bit? I'll be right back. Said we're a, uh, like a conglomeration of different groups that came together to put this on. Um, so we actually we have cards here that if there's anybody here that's not involved with a Christian group or isn't even a Christian but has more questions wants to follow up, um, we have cards here that you can fill out and we'll collect them. We're not going to spam your inbox or your phone or whatever. Um, if you don't if you're not interested, you don't need to take one of these. But we just want this to be an option for those who want to be followed up, want a faith community, want to ask their questions about faith, to to walk through together. Um, so if you would like one of those, please raise your hand and then we have a few people here that have these cards. They'll walk around, they'll give it to you, and then Mark's Mark will collect them on your way out. Um, so again, if you want those, raise your hand, they'll come around and they'll give those to you. Um, Frank is using the restroom real quick, and when he comes back, we're going to have questions. So if you do not want have any questions or you, or you don't want to stick around for questions, um, that is the official end of the event. So thank you for coming out. Um, if you want to have questions, please come to the microphone and ask your questions, and Frank will respond to the questions that you have. Um, we ask that they, you come so that you know everybody can hear you and hear the questions so that we're not trying to shout across the room, things like that. So if you have a question, um, perhaps you can come line up, or you come over here. OK, so I'm going to go this way. <laughs> so you can line this way. If you have a question, line up, and you can ask your question. Um, again, if you want one of these forms, please raise your hand or find somebody with the forms and you can take one of those before you get out of here. But if you have questions, please line up. James, go ahead, sir. Frank. Sir, sir Frank. Frank's fine. Go ahead. Yeah. You're very kind. Uh, Frank, this book, you've spoken very well. Mm -hmm. And I hope that everybody here We'll get a chance to, per, to buy as, as many books of yours as they can to only to read to themselves and their friends and, and anybody that they find. Thank you. I also, think, uh, James has been in one of our online classes. That's yes, yes. Been. First time I've met him. <laughs> it, it is good to meet you in person. Thank you, sir. You too. My question is, would you like me to show you a miracle tonight? Show a miracle? Yes. What are you going to do? I don't know him. God does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a young man back there. Uh-huh. He gave a Bible to earlier. Yes. And uh, you remember at the beginning when you were talking about judgment? Yes. And how it is important to judge? Yes. I would like to ask him, where, where is he? Where are you? You getting me out of the Bible. I don't know if he's still here, James. We'll pick him up later. Let's go to the next question. Hang on, James. All right. You have it open? Huh? Does, do you have it open? Yeah, he's got it open. Please read John 7:24. John 7:24 says, "Stop judging by mere appearances." No, 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 not you. Him. Oh. <laughs> Him. 
Thank you. That's a miracle right there. <laughs> Thank you, James. Yes. God bless you. Yeah, that, that is true. A lot of people, they read judge not, but they don't read John 7, 24, which says stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, my name's Kyle. Uh, I noticed uh, when you were talking about some of the arguments for God's existence, you didn't talk about the um, ontological argument, mm -hmm. Anselm's ontological argument, mm -hmm. which is one that I know a lot of people find convincing, but I, I find it really difficult to rationalize. Yes. Do, you, do you have thoughts on the ontological argument? And because it's so controversial, I don't use the ontological argument. Some people think it's good, other people don't think it's good. Mm -hmm. So why would I use an argument that sure. is so controversial when I think these arguments here that we talked about tonight are much more persuasive. Mm -hmm. Actually, they're, at, the, what I showed you here are not the best arguments for God. You know mm -hmm. what the best arguments for God are? Metaphysical arguments mm -hmm. that Thomas Aquinas put together. Mm -hmm. But in order to understand Thomas Aquinas, it's like trying to gargle peanut butter. Yeah. Okay? Uh -huh. But when you do understand Aquinas, you go, oh, I got it now. Uh -huh. The problem is it's hard for me to understand, and it would be harder for me to try and explain you need a lot of background philosophical knowledge to understand some of Aquinas' arguments so we don't use them. But if we had more time, I'd go through some of those arguments. Great. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. What's your name? Hello. My name is Zane. Zane. Go ahead, um, sir. So when you were talking about the tele teleological argument, yes. you were talking about how uh, there are so many stars and it represents the infinite love mm -hmm. and infinite just justness of God. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is, if God is truly just, how can he punish people for... Uh, how can he punish people infinitely in hell for finite sin, like the Bible seems to say? Yeah, great question. Isn't hell overkill for a finite sin? Okay. First of all, we know that even in this world, the length of the punishment is usually a lot longer than the length of the crime, right? I mean, you can kill somebody in two seconds, but your punishment is not just two seconds, right? You may spend the rest of your life in prison, or you might be executed, okay? Secondly, a sin against an infinite being might require an infinite punishment. And thirdly, who says you stop sinning when you get to hell? You're still gnashing your teeth against God, so the punishment continues. And there may be some other reasons too. But since God is just, he's the standard of justice, nobody's going to get into the afterlife and be treated unjustly. Everybody is either going to be treated in one of two ways. You're either going to get justice or you're going to get grace. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Zane. Good question. Quinn. Dr. Dr. Turk. Yes, sir. Go Thank ahead. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was just curious on your, um, or your understanding of uh, hell. Like I know people you know, choose by their own accord to mm -hmm. be separate from God, mm -hmm. and by doing that, mm -hmm. they then enter hell. Yeah. Um, but I don't understand how, you know, this un eternally loving God, which I'm a Christian, so like mm -hmm. I, you know, relationships there, but yeah. I don't understand how he could have the knowledge that people or our souls exist in this place without him mm -hmm. in eternal damnation and torment and not, and, uh, and be pleased with that and, and continue to exist. He's um, not pleased with it, well, but he is it, it, giving, it hurt, yeah, it, giving them what they want. They don't want to sure. be in his presence. And so I guess to be more specific, like uh, annihilationism mm -hmm. seems um, friendly in, in the face of eternal torment. And so I was just wondering your opinion of annihilationism. First of all, I think there are some verses in the New Testament that can be interpreted as annihilation, uh, annihilationism. Mm -hmm. Easy for me to say after two hours of yakking. <laughs> uh, but I don't think it goes through overall because I think in Matthew 25, Jesus juxtaposes eternal life and eternal punishment with the same words. Mm -hmm. So if eternal punishment is temporary, that would mean eternal life must be temporary too, and none of us believe that. Mm -hmm. Okay, But what you're doing is you're comparing nothing to something, which is a category mistake. You can't compare something that doesn't exist, a person that's been annihilated, with someone mm -hmm. who does. There's no way to compare them because you're comparing nothing to something. If there was another place they could go, then you could compare those two things. But as I just mentioned a minute ago, whoever goes to hell is getting treated justly. And not everybody's going to be at the same level of punishment. Sure, I agree with yeah. that. But if, if you are completely separate from the one who, who is able to create and you're no mm -hmm. longer in any communion with the creator, mm -hmm. then that would be the absence of creation, which is non-existence. And so... No, it's not non-existence. It's, it's just existence with, apart from him. Evil is anti-creation. 
You, mm -hmm. It's one way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about before, evil's like cancer. So it's, it, it, it erodes the body. Sure. Okay, so it's taking away from a good thing. Mm -hmm. Rust, taking away from a good car. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's been put this way, that hell is like going to a junkyard and seeing an old car that's been totaled. You can still mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. what kind of car it was, but you can see it's all rusted out. It's, it's not in good shape. It's a shell of its former self. And that's what it will be like in hell. Mm -hmm. You will be in a state that you're totaled. But mm -hmm. you're choosing, you've already made a choice, and as C.S. Lewis has put it, it doesn't take much faith to believe that omniscience knows when a final choice has been made. Mm -hmm. God knows that even if he were to go to hell and try and get people out, they wouldn't want. They wouldn't want to come with him. There's a point where, a point of no return, where people have made their choice and they're never going to repent. Mm -hmm. And God knows when that is. Okay. So. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you, Quinn. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hi. Uh, yes, sir. My, what's your name? Yeah, Logan. Logan, go ahead. Um, so people pass on stories, often telling a reimagined or reinterpreted recap of the original event. Mm -hmm. How do you suggest that a sinful and imperfect Western culture has the writings, stories, and interpretation of Christianity correct today, if an imperfect society has been God's primary social footprint on earth? Okay, well, first of all, it's not this Western culture that has given us Christianity. It's the apostles who wrote Christianity down 2,000 years ago. It's how maybe we interpret it or misinterpret it now that we may get it wrong. But it sounds almost like you're saying that sinful people can't be trusted. Is that what you're saying? Um, I don't think anyone can be trusted. We all have the intent of self-preservation in a world that's constantly in a battle. Okay, but can I trust what you just said to me? I would say no. Well, then you're not saying anything, <laughs> right? See, what, what if, you're saying here is that uh, people err and people are sinful, and I agree with that. But people don't always err, and they're not always sinful. It's like when people say, I can't trust the Bible because it's been written by men. The implication is, is that men always err. No, they don't always err. In fact, there are many inerrant books out there. Most kids' books are inerrant, right? Mm -hmm. See, socks run. <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are many inerrant books, but Christians believe there's one inspired book. But if people were to say, I can't believe in men because they err, they shouldn't believe themselves. And that very statement, is mm -hmm. that statement an error? No, you're, the state, when you say people are, when people, people make mistakes and people are sinful, you're right about that. Mm -hmm. But they don't always do so. Okay. So you're suggesting that one book was written in complete perfection without any social or any understanding of what's happening around them. Oh, sure. There's a lot of social understanding about what, what was around them. In fact, in order for us so to let me understand that, sorry, the interpretation. What's that? They're, they're writing about an interpretation of an event they saw. So you're saying that there's no chance that there's flaws in that. Oh, there could be. Oh, there's a chance. Sure there is. Yeah, there's definitely a chance. The question is, do they have errors in their interpretation? Like, are you suggesting that maybe they had hallucinations rather than Jesus rose from the dead? Is that what you're saying, perhaps? I think that that could be definitely a trauma response, yes. It could be, sure. But the problem is, as we know, people don't have group hallucinations. They don't, no. Right? So to have all these people say they saw the resurrected Jesus, it might be explained if one saw him, mm -hmm. but not all these different people. Okay. So hallucinations wouldn't make sense. Uh, and they also wouldn't make sense if the tomb had Jesus' body in it, mm -hmm. because the authorities would have gone to the tomb and taken the body out and said, you're just hallucinating. Here, he's dead. Here he is. Right? Couldn't do that either. So halluc the hallucination theory doesn't work. Okay. No, you are correct. It could be wrong. I think the evidence shows that they were right. All right. Thank you. All right. Good question. <laughs> yes, sir. What's Hi, your Frank, name? How's it going? My name is Caleb. Caleb, go ahead. Okay. So I've had conversations with atheists, uh, agnostics, so on and so forth. And mm -hmm. kind of one thing they often bring up to me is, how do I know that the Bible is legitimate, or how, how do I know that there wasn't a group of people that got together, say, in the 300s, 400s, came up with a story that, to control the population, something along those lines? Because I've heard that argument before. Okay, well, you've seen some of the evidence tonight. Right. So you got another two hours? You want me to go over it again? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Um, there's also ways we know that the New Testament writers, um, what they wrote down, we actually have. Because what manuscript experts do is they compare all the copies and they can figure out uh, what the original said by comparing the copies. I can give you an example of this if you want to see it. 
Um, because that's often a question. How do we know that the New Testament writers, what they wrote down, we actually have? Well, what we do, if I can find this example here, if I have it, and I might not in this. I don't know if I have it here. Stand by for vectors, Victor. Call for Clarence, Clarence. Roger, Roger. Do we have any airplane fans in here? I mean, come on. I don't think I have that slide here I wanted to show you guys. Anyway, you can compare what these different manuscripts say and figure out what the original said. Also, it's not just the New Testament documents that give us the theology of Christianity. The early church fathers and people that knew the writers of the New Testament and were mentored by them say the same thing over the first three centuries of the church. So you have what my friend Jay Warner Wallace, the cold case homicide detective, calls the chain of custody. You know, when he's working a homicide case, if they find a, a shell, a bullet shell at a site, they've got to document whoever handles that particular piece of evidence all the way to the court because if that piece of evidence is tampered with, then it's bad evidence and it can't be admissible in court. So they have to keep track of what happens to that piece of evidence. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to the uh, New Testament writers, what they say. The, the people that followed the New Testament writers, people like Clement and Ignatius and many others, they, in their writings, say the same thing about Jesus all through the first few centuries of history. So not only do you have the scriptures telling you what happened, you also have the church fathers giving you the basic essentials of what happened as well. So you've got corroboration there. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Thank All right. you. Thank you, Caleb. Yes, sir. What's your I'm name? Gary. Gary, go ahead. Um, I'm a pastor for a church, and one of the things that I've noticed... That's your first mistake, right? There. I know, right? <laughs> I know, right? Go ahead, Gary. One of the things I've noticed is that a lot of the youth are leaving Christianity, yeah. not specifically at the church that we're at, but just in general... Do you think they're leaving Christianity because they're essentially told by their parents to believe in Christianity rather than why they should be? Because I, I grew up with friends, and they were saying, yeah, we know about God, we know about Jesus. But really, there was no in-depth um, lessons given to them on why you should believe that. Yeah, apologetics is not something that's done in many churches, and that, mm -hmm. I think, is a shame. Because mm -hmm. the easiest way to get picked off in a war is to not know you're in one. Yeah. And people n not only come into to a university, but just right on their phones yeah. are getting skepticism from all over the world. Now, this thing is a blessing and a curse. Why? Yeah. It's a blessing because a lot of truth comes through here. It's a curse because a lot of error also comes mm -hmm. through here, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're, not, if you're not equipped to deal with the error, then you could be easily taken away mm -hmm. from the truth. So it's essential, in my view that we ought to teach young people why Christianity is true. Not mm -hmm. just that it's true, but why is it true? Yeah, I think so too. So they can handle yeah. uh, the skepticism they're going right. to get either on the internet or when mm -hmm. they come off to university. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great Thank question. You. Thank you. And thanks for being a pastor, by the way. <laughs> Second hardest job in American Christianity. Hardest job, pastor's wife. <laughs> oh, right there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. What's your name? Uh, uh, Roy. Roy, go ahead, sir. And uh, I promote uh, Christian view of world and, and creationism and debate evolutionists. Yeah. And um, I, my phrase I use is that variety never becomes evolution. I'm a, I teach kinds, reproduce after kinds. Right, yeah. I, and I'm just wondering, do you have Get a, a little closer if you would to that. Do you have any um, short advice for someone who debates evolutionists? Well, you, you want to ask them a lot of questions on why they believe what they believe. What evidence do you have that evolution is actually true? Macroevolution, not micro. We all agree with micro. And in fact, here is one little chart, if I can find it, that I think really demonstrates what Darwin found. Okay? I haven't seen one chart that shows you any better than this. Look at this. Here's change attributed to nat natural selection. Notice it changed with the weather. The beak depth of the finches changed with the weather on a area on a, on a, a period when you had dry weather, the beaks of the finches tended to be bigger. 
in wet weather, the beaks tended to be smaller. Okay, why? Well, the proportion of large beak finches to small beak finches changed because in dry weather, you had to have a stronger beak to get into the ground to get seeds out. So you had a bigger beak, generally. But notice, what you have here is finches, and you end with finches. And the change in the finch beak depth was cyclical with the weather. It wasn't directional. In other words, the beaks just didn't, kept, just didn't get bigger and bigger and bigger until you, these finches became pelicans, right? <laughs> they always stayed finches. They started as finches, and they ended with finches. And I think the best kind of phrase that you can say with regard to natural selection is that natural selection may help explain the survival of a species, but not the arrival of a species. That's the difference. And what evolutionists have said, in the past anyway, is if we add up enough of these microevolutionary changes, we're going to get a new type. And notice, in this instance, you don't get it. You just get the proportion of large beak finches to the small beak finches changing based on the weather. You always start with finches, you end with finches. And I think there's good evidence to show that macroevolution uh, is, is not true. Let me just give it to you in an acronym, L-I-F-E, L, -I -F -E -L limited, uh, or limited genetic change. We can't modify dogs outside the genus of dogs. We can get dogs as small as chihuahuas, as large as Great Danes, but we can't break the barriers that uh, there appear to be in the genome. If we can't, using all our intelligence, why should we expect a non-intelligent non process to do so? I, I stands for irreducible complexity. I'm sure you're familiar with that, that everything needs to change at once to have function. You can't change a organism gradually and still have function, it'll die. All the other parts need to be changed with it. The F stands for the fossil record. As you know, the Cambrian explosion shows that the major body plans, most of the major body plans happened in a geological instant, instant uh, speaking uh, of a geological instant, in their terms would be just a few million years, back 550 million years ago. They just appeared, there's no fossil precursors. And so that appears more like creation, as even Richard Dawkins has admitted, than evolution. And the E stands for epigenetic information, which shows that the structure of a creature, not just the DNA, is what you need in order to get a new body plan. You can modify DNA from now to doomsday, you'll never get a new body plan. You need to change the structure as well, and that can't be modified in a DNA-like fashion through mutation. So those are the four things, if I only had a minute, limited cha genetic change, irreducible complexity, fossil record, and epigenetic information. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Maxwell, go ahead, sir. That's a great presentation. Um, so you mentioned how um, for early Christians, many of them, because they didn't have a Bible, they didn't come to believe in Jesus as a result of reading the Bible, but right. rather having a relationship right. and knowing Jesus. I was wondering if um, you believe that, for example, like an uncontacted tribe like the Sintonese, that any of them being there uncontacted by like Christians, that they could know and have a relationship with Jesus? There are stories like that. The Bible doesn't tell us that, so this is speculation. But I know stories of tribes that when people actually got there with the gospel, they went, we knew there was something like this that was true. <laughs> we knew there had to be a sacrifice somewhere. In fact, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the book. It goes back like 30 years. It has something to do with a rainforest, but I can't remember the exact name of the book. So Eternity this is, in their hearts. Peace it, child. Peace Child, that wasn't it. What? Eternity in their hearts. Eternity, Eternity in their hearts, that might be it. Terry, that might be right. Eternity in the hearts. Who was that by? Do you remember? Don Richards. Same guy who wrote Peace Child. Don Richards. Don Richards. Don Richards. It might be that book. I might be thinking of another one. But yeah, there are instances where people, they're totally open to the gospel because they knew something like the gospel has to be true. Yeah. So, so would they be then saved the moment that they are uh, they have contact with those missionaries, I suppose, or is it that they were already saved and then they're like, oh, finally I have fellowship with someone with beliefs I already have? Only God knows that, okay. right? It appears that the more biblically 
uh, consistent view is you have to know the name of Jesus to be saved, mm. right? But we know there are many people that hear the name of Jesus and don't believe, right? Mm -hmm. yes. It could be that those that never hear the name of Jesus wouldn't have believed anyway. Mm -hmm. That's possible, right? As I mentioned before, God wants people to be saved more than we do. So in the afterlife, people are going to get one of two things, grace or justice. And if God knew that they, if a missionary had got there, they would have been saved, then maybe God goes, okay, I'm saving them anyway, right? Or it could be, as the writer of Hebrews says, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God will get you the gospel in order to be saved before you die. In fact, there are very credible stories coming out of many Muslim countries where Jesus is appearing to people either in dreams or physically because they're seeking the truth. Mm. So that might be, in fact, Nabil Qureshi, who tragically passed away about five years ago, but was a Muslim, became a Christian, wrote in his book, uh, Seeking Allah, Finding, Finding Jesus, actually had a vision that made him believe that Christianity was indeed true. Mm. And he's a medical doctor. Wow. All right? All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Maxwell. Yes, sir. Howdy. Well, sir, what's your name? I'm Evan. Evan, go ahead. Pleasure to meet you. Great talk. You too. Thank you, Evan. Um, I want to ask a quick question about your belief about claiming the promises of God. Mm -hmm. You made a, uh, a brief comment about Jeremiah 29, 11. Yeah. I know Spurgeon was even wrote a book on claiming the promises of God and in what context to do so. So I want to get a little bit of clarity from sure. you about how you believe we should properly interpret and claim the promises of God and if they're still relevant to us and how we move forward and walk the Christian life. Because God being faithful, he doesn't go back on his word. It's very clear. Um, Numbers twenty three nineteen is very clear that God doesn't speak and then not act. Right, but he, he, we have to figure out who the promises are to before we say that's a promise for us, right? So that's why I juxtapose Jeremiah 29.11 with Jeremiah 44.11. Nobody claims the promise of Jeremiah 44.11. Why? Because we don't like it, right? But we all claim the promise of Jeremiah 29.11, even though neither of them were written to us, right? They're not promises to us. They were promises to the people that either went to Babylon or went to Egypt, okay? There are promises to us, Probably the closest thing to Jeremiah 29, 11 that does apply to us is Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, notice he doesn't say all things are good. He said all things work together for good. And then it, he goes on to say to be conformed to the image of his son. So sometimes you go through difficulty to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That's the closest promise to Jeremiah 29, 11 in the New Testament, unless you want to say the promise of eternal life, mm -hmm. obviously, that where there will be no more pain, no more, uh, no more suffering, no more sorrow, uh, but a specific promise that was made to the exiles in 586 BC to go to Babylon and what they're going to get after they spend 70 years from, that, from there is not a promise to us. It may tell us about the character of God, and okay. it does. It may tell us about how God used through history to get the promised people in the promised land to bring forth the promised Messiah to bless the whole world, but it's not a specific promise to us. And one of the reasons I talk about this is because I think not only do we not know the Bible, we don't know how to interpret the Bible. Has anybody in here ever been in a course at your church on how to interpret the Bible? I see about five hands out of maybe two, three hundred people. You would think, if this really is the word of God, that we would be much more overt about teaching how people how to, how to interpret it. What could be more important than that if it's truly the word of God? But what do we do? We rely on one guy standing up here every Sunday, and in America today, that normally means he's going to pick out one verse, maybe yank it out of context, and say something that will amuse the crowd. It's, a, it's, it's amazing, it's, it's, or it's not amazing why we don't know what the scriptures say. So we actually created an online course called How to Interpret Your Bible. And I'll, I'll give you the, the spine of it here in just a minute. Whenever you come across a passage, you ought to stop. S-T-O-P is an acronym. I like acronyms. You remember them. S stands for what's the situation. So Jeremiah 29, 11, what's the situation? Exiles are, are in Babylon. 
God's writing them a letter through Jeremiah promising them a bright future 70 years from then, mm -hmm. okay? T, that's type of literature. Well, Jeremiah is a prophet, okay? This is a prophecy book. Oh, who's the object of the passage? The object of the passage is not 21st century Christians. The object of the passage are the exiles that went to Babylon. P, is this prescriptive or descriptive? It's not a prescription. He's not prescribing to us what's going to happen. He was prescribing to them, but for us, it's a description. This is what God promised to the people that lived 2,400 years ago who went to Babylon. Does that make sense? Yeah, quick follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, why would God allow the Bible to be twisted in such a way where we do see a prevalent prosperity gospel being preached in America to the point where Jesus is no longer at the center stage, but it's us and it's our, our abundant life and it's our prosperity. Um, any thoughts on why do we twist the Bible so often and for our own purposes and why are we not in check? Yeah, because we're human beings and we're fallen. That's why we need a savior. Uh, that's why James says, beware of being a teacher because you're gonna be judged to a higher standard, James 3.1. But you could ask that question about any event. Why did God allow so-and-so to lie to somebody else or hurt somebody else. Well, if God intervenes every time we do something wrong, we're not free. Hmm. And we can't even learn from our mistakes. It's not a moral universe. Hmm. So God gives us free will. That way we can make moral choices. That way we can love. The problem is we can also sin. So what does God do? He comes into this space-time continuum to actually redeem the sin that we have committed. So he can actually allow us to love and allow us to sin, but he can fix the sin for those people that want it fixed. For those that don't, he's going he's gonna to leave them alone. That's what hell ultimately is. It's separation from God. All right? Appreciate your time. Hey, okay, thanks, Evan. Good questions. Yes, sir. What's your name? Jared. Jared, go ahead. Um, my question is, are the Old Testament characters from the Bible, like David, Samson, Moses, are those considered, are they in heaven? Because when they were before Jesus' time, so how did, they, were they able to be in eternal life? And then my second question is, is, does God create a person just for damnation? Okay, let's start with the first question and we won't have any time for the second question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it appears that when David says, well, let's go back to when David's son died as a result of his liaison with Bathsheba. His son dies, and he's mourning, and as soon as his son dies, he gets up, and he goes about his day, and his assistants come to him and say, King, you were mourning when the baby was dying. Now that the baby's died, you're not mourning anymore. Why not? And David said, he will not come to me, but I will go to him. Mm -hmm. The implication is, is that he will see his son in the afterlife. Now, the Old Testament does not talk a lot about the afterlife, but it does talk about it on occasion. Uh, the transfiguration. Who's at the transfiguration? Abraham. Moses and Elijah, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. And Jesus. Uh, so it does appear that there is an afterlife, but heaven, the ultimate heaven, hasn't been created yet. What's the ultimate heaven? In, in Revelation. At the yeah, new the new heaven and new earth is going to be recreated, and we're going to get physical bodies. So right now, as we know it, we're absent from the body, present with the Lord, okay? All the people that lived before Jesus, they didn't know the name of Jesus, but as Paul says, the gospel was preached to Abraham. He didn't know the name of Jesus, but he knew he was saved by grace through faith. So Jesus' sacrifice took care of sins before the cross, and of course, after the cross as well, there's just a different content of that of how you get that salvation after the cross, because you have, to, you have to know the name of Jesus, as we just spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, the second question was? It was, does God create a person just to condemn them to hell? No, not just to condemn them to hell, because I guess the question could be stated this way, does God why does God create people he knew would go to hell? Yeah. Right, that's basically the question, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, God can get his will done even through atheists or people who don't believe in him. Let me give you an example. Say Richard Dawkins writes a book, he's a famous atheist, the God delusion. Christian picks it up, starts to read it, and goes, oh, I've never heard that argument against God. I've got to do some research. So as a result of reading the God delusion, a Christian's getting closer to God. No. Right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, he is. He's, he's now trying to 
trying to see how to answer what Dawkins says. It's not hard, actually. Dawkins does not have good arguments against God, okay? In fact, when I read Dawkins, I get more confident that Christianity is true, okay? Uh, in fact, my co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, who's forgotten more than I'll ever know, said, I, I read atheists for devotions. <laughs> because I go, this is all you got? Are you kidding me? But secondly, God also works through people who are not believers. If you're a Christian in here, you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for atheists. Why? Because you have atheists in your bloodline that are required for you to be here. So you wouldn't even be here. The way we reproduce, uh, we reproduce uh, through <laughs> other people. And not all those people are Christians. Okay? Mm -hmm. So God can still get his will done by atheists existing. When he creates them, he may know what they're going to do, but he's not causing them to be atheists. Just because you know what's going to happen doesn't mean you're causing it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't use your baby because your baby's such a good example. But normally I say when, when a mother brings a baby home from the hospital and puts the baby down to sleep at night, that mother knows at some point that baby's going to wake up and want to eat, right? Mm -hmm. But because the mother knows that, is she causing the baby to wake up? No. no. Knowledge does not necessarily imply causation. This is, I think, one of the keys to the whole predestination free will debate. People go, well, if God knows what I'm going to do, I don't have free will. No, you still have free will. He just knows how you're going to use it. Okay? You're still freely doing what you do. So when God created this universe, he knew some would believe and some wouldn't. In that sense, he elected the outcome. But people are still freely doing what they're doing. Now, it might be logically possible that God can create a universe where everyone believes. That's logically possible. It's just not actually achievable with free creatures. Because what... Even an omnipotent God can't do is he can't force free creatures to do what he wants. Because if he does, they're not free. Right? Yes. So this is the universe that God created, which apparently has the maximum number of people to be saved and the minimum number of people to be lost. So no, he doesn't create them to be lost. Even though he knows that they might be lost or will be lost, he can still get his will done through what they do and how they interact with the rest of the world. In fact, if you take atheists out of this world, we have a completely different world. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We are Christians. Take anybody out of the world. It's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. All right? So then could someone, ch so like, so someone could change their, like, if, if they're destined to still go to hell, could they change and, like, or would that just They're not, not destined to go to hell. They're freely choosing not to accept the ticket out of hell. Mm -hmm. uh, they're freely doing that. God just knows before he creates what they're going to do, right? But knowing it doesn't mean he's causing it. If, if they were to change their, their mind later in life, he would have known they would have done that too, right? Yeah. Because he's all-knowing. It's unavoidable. God knows all things. He knows every possible contingency how things are going to work out. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Caitlin, go ahead. So earlier um, you said during the, the question, does truth exist, mm -hmm. you said a question to ask someone who's like a non-believer mm -hmm. or is questioning um, if God is real mm -hmm. and all that stuff. You said if Christianity were to be true, would you become a Christian? Yes. And then you said that if they said no or hesitate, it's like mm -hmm. it's not a head problem, it's a heart problem. Yeah. So if that person were to say yes, this is like a more practical thing of mm -hmm. like how do you continue like that conversation if they say oh, yes? Oh, well, like, why don't we look at the evidence together then? Let's do a study together and see if it actually is true. You might start with mere Christianity, as I mentioned earlier, which just starts from the moral law. If you want the whole argument, we have it in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, or you can use a whole bunch of other books. You can use Cold Case Christianity by my friend Jay Warner Walsh. You might pick up uh, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. I mean, there's tons of books out there. So I would just say, well, why don't we, since it's so important, why don't we just study it together and see where the evidence leads? So what if they're not like interested in that then? Uh, well, even God can't steer a parked car, right? <laughs> if they're not interested, there's not much you can do except there's four things you can do. Pray. You can plant seeds every now and then about why Christianity is true or why what they might believe might not be true. You can love them, which, as I said earlier, doesn't mean you approve of everything they do. And then you can wait. And when you wait, Usually, everyone experiences some kind of difficulty in life. 
if they're ever going to be open, it's at that point, and then your phone is going to ring, and that person's going to be on the other end. When the student's ready, the teacher will appear. They're not going to call their atheist friend when things go wrong. What's the atheist going to say? Oh, there's no rhyme or reason to life. This stuff just happens. Right? They're going to call you. So they may have said yes, but they're not really interested, so they're apathetic. And my co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, used to say once he was asked, What's the greatest problem in America today? Is it ignorance or apathy? And he said, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> Apathy's hard. All right? So Thank pray you. for them. Thanks, Thank Caitlin. <laughs> yes, ma'am, what's your name? I'm Terry. Terry, and, uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much for your work. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Terry. We didn't get a chance to applaud, did we? Can we just? Oh, well, thank you, Terry. <laughs> Ahead, yeah. Man. So I was raised Catholic and so was, I. was a um, believer for 17 years. I became an atheist in college. Uh -huh. One of those lovely professors that uh, you know asked at the beginning, "How many of you guys are Christian?" And at the end, it's like, "Yeah, you won't be Christian anymore." Mm -hmm. So I lost my faith for 17 years. I was very blessed to get it back, and uh, your work really helps prevent backsliding just because of the wonderful rationality. So we've spent a lot of time investing in apologetics, raised our children with head faith, not just heart faith. Good. But now that you know our kids are out in the world at lovely public educational mm -hmm. institutions. So my son had a really good question the other day. He said, why is it that in the New Testament we give the words of Paul and Jude the same weight as we do the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about the canon of the New Testament. Yes. You know, we know that Jesus kind of certified the Old Testament. Right. But he was gone before the New Testament was written. Right. It, so that was a stumper for me. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I think I'm going to go see Dr. Turk. And yeah, Jesus <laughs> promised the New Testament. And, and, and in the, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. We cover this in a little bit more detail. He promised the New Testament. And the people that... Um, were the ones that actually were confirmed as apostles mm -hmm. are the people that wrote the New Testament. So mm -hmm. some people say, what book should we find in the Bible? And you notice we have this little thing on the bottom says, the canon, which means standard, right. that's all it means, uh, is not required for proving the resurrection. Even if none of the books of the New Testament are inspired, mm -hmm. they could still be telling largely the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. for Christians, inspiration and inerrancy is a conclusion. It's not a premise. You don't start there. You mm -hmm. try and see if the documents are accurate enough to let us know what Jesus did mm -hmm. and what he taught. And if you can know that, the reason I believe the Bible's inerrant is because Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And I may have said earlier, I just have a personal policy. If somebody predicts and accomplishes <laughs> his own resurrection from the dead, I just trust right, whatever the guy right, says. Right. But here you go. How do we know the books are the true books of the Bible? And Bruce Metzger of Princeton University put it this way. The canon is a list of authoritative books more than it is an authoritative list of books. Mm -hmm. Now, why is he saying that? Because people will say, well, the church determined what books should be in the canon, mm -hmm. which is nonsense. First of all, the church didn't really exist for the first 300 years almost of Christianity. Mm -hmm. They were on the run. Mm -hmm. There wasn't an organized, in a sense, Roman Catholic Church till probably the 500s at some right. point, okay? Right. After Constantine. But in any event, um, he's basically here saying that mm -hmm. the church discovered what should be in the, When I say the church, I mean the believers, mm -hmm. not the Roman Catholic Church. Right, right, right. Discovered what should be in the canon, didn't determine it. So here's how you discover the canon. Was it written by a prophet of God? And how do you, how do you test a prophet? Does his work come, does his things stay, uh, come true? Yeah. Was the writer confirmed by acts of God or someone who is confirmed as an eyewitness? For example, Paul confirmed Luke, right? These are some of the tests they used. And was it accepted by the people of God? Mm -hmm. And if you really look, get into this, you'll notice that the confirmation of authorship and authority is really only in the Gospels and the other books that we have. Gospels and Acts are cited during the, during the lives of the apostles, right? These, right. Are, these are very early. They're quoted as authoritative and unique. They're collected early in one volume. They're publicly read and expounded. 
commentaries were written on these books, and the opponents admitted the Gospels were written by the disciples, and no other Gospels were treated this way. Now, the writings of Paul, some say many of them are earlier than the Gospels, right? Like, for example, uh, Galatians. Galatians is probably 49 A.D., and if Galatians is 49, maybe Mark's written before then, maybe Luke around that time. Mm -hmm. But John is written later, mm -hmm. uh, probably Matthew's written later. Right. But there are creeds throughout the New Testament. These are short statements mm -hmm. that people memorized orally before they were written down. And the earliest one is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8, which talks yeah. about all of the people to whom Jesus appeared. And that was written in 55 A.D. when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, but it goes all the way back to the event itself. Even skeptical scholars admit right. it's within a year or two of the resurrection itself. Right, right. So why do we take Paul? Because Paul's confirmed by miracles too, mm -hmm. right? And so sure. is uh, so are uh, Jude and and mm -hmm. other writers in the New Testament. Gotcha. Well, Peter. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, that's good. So miracles help confirm. Right. the New Testament writers. Now, we might not know much about Jude. He was a half-brother of Jesus. We know James, by the way, was killed as a martyr in 62 AD. Mm -hmm. Josephus tells us this. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Bible. but yeah. So there are, there are ways we can figure out um, who really speaks for God mm -hmm. in the New Testament. Right, right. But that's not really a quick answer. So no. you're going to have to tell the kid to do his own homework. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's right. You got it, Terry. But uh, the book has a lot more in it. Oh, yeah. Right? I love that book. Yeah, and the problem in America, we want everything in a sound bite. Not everything can be in a sound bite. Right, that's right. Right? That's, that's true. And just a really quick uh -huh. do you believe that there was a source gospel before Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke? Some say there was a Q. source called Q, mm -hmm. which is a German, it comes from a German word, Coelho, which means source. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not, don't know. Okay. There you All right, go. thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's your name? Anthony. Anthony, go ahead, sir. Yeah, when you was answering the question about, like, interpreting the uh -huh. Bible and how it could be so many different interpretations, that made me think about, like, the actions that end up with how we interpret it. So, like, say, for instance, being a follower of God and stuff, if we interpret it wrong, per se, like, we just thought into it too much, and that led to our actions being wrong, like a person that's really evident to the Bible, the way they might answer certain questions may lead other people not to get to Christianity because they might feel it as bashing or so. Like, say, for instance, you know that you cause problems or you got necessarily, like, blood on your hands, like you're stopping other people from going to the uh, Bible based on your actions, and you got that guilt. Like, I know a lot of disciples, like, some dealt with suicide, some, like, suicidal thoughts, and some dealt with, like, all these things, but their heart was still in the right mm -hmm. sort of way. So, and God made the covenant, like we, like you said, we choose to live our life apart from God and stuff. So based off the actions that we've done in the past, even though we're still on the right foot and our heart is still in the right place, if we don't feel like we deserve to get there because of how we've led other people in our life, do you think we would still go to like the kingdom? Um, why do you ask that, Anthony? Uh, like my father, he passed away, but like he was a real believer of God. But me and him would get into arguments based on like how he felt about uh, the Bible and he interpreted it wrong. Like, say, for instance, if I took his words and just not, not came to God because of everything he said, I just didn't want to be a believer. Now, I'm not a believer, and even if I become a believer later, long, later, later on in my life, he feels like he was the reason why I was doing what I was doing or stuff like that. Like, even if I forgave him and everything, him and his heart didn't uh, feel like that. Okay, well, Jesus does talk about leading little ones astray. It'd be ready to have a mil better to have a millstone hung around their neck to, to take, take one of these little ones who believes in me away, right? But grace is always available no matter what has happened. Mm -hmm. In fact, what you don't gain by moral effort, you can't lose by moral error. You don't gain salvation by doing everything right morally. And for that reason, you can't lose salvation by doing things immorally. You're saved by grace because what Christ has done. What we're supposed to do, if we recognize that we've been teaching wrongly, we need to repent of it and go to the people that we can still go to and say, hey, I got that wrong. Here's what I think the right interpretation is. All right. But God can even draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And we're all crooked sticks. Amen. So 
I'm sure there are many things I believe that I don't, I don't have it right, okay? Hopefully I have the essentials right. That's what I'm more concerned about than, you know, who are the, the writers, the riders on the, on the white horses, you know, or who, you know, so, some of these secondary or tertiary issues, right? Um, I try and, and focus on the essentials. In fact, my mentor, Dr. Norman Geiser, who lived to 87, the older he got, he said, the more sure I am of the essentials, the less sure I am of the secondary issues. And so we got to focus on the essentials, what C.S. Lewis would call mere Christianity. If we get that right and focus on that and try and preach that to the world, then we can really make an impact. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank but you. there's grace, so don't worry about it. Just repent and move on if it affects you. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is Isaac. Isaac, go ahead. Um, so the Bible says that sin entered the world through the one man, Adam, and yes. death through sin. Yes. Um, do you think views like long, um, old, earth, old earth creationism, gap theory, theistic evolution that seem to necessitate thousands or millions of years of animal death before the fall and before sin, are they reasonable for a Christian to hold? Yes, because normally Christians will say, young earth creationists will say that uh, there can't be death before the fall because of Romans 5.12. But Romans 5.12 doesn't say what some of them think it says. It doesn't say death came to all creation. It says death came to all men through Adam's sin. There could have been animal death and was animal death long before Adam showed up if the old earth view, view is true. Now, people ask me, how old is the universe? And I always say, I'm absolutely convinced the universe is at least 61 years old. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to throw my mom in there. It's at least 85. Actually, I think the evidence is much better it's old. But no matter how far back you go, whether you go back to um, thousands of years or billions of years, you still need a creator. Mm -hmm. You don't get rid of the need for a creator billions of years ago or thousands of years ago. You're still going to have a creation. And I think the short answer to Genesis 1, if you read Genesis 1, Genesis 1 says, Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God. God created, created the heavens and the earth. earth. Okay, when did God create the heavens and the earth? In the beginning. In the beginning. Does it say when the beginning was? No. No. You say, what about the days? The days don't begin until verse 3. If you want to take a real wooden, literal trans or, uh, interpretation of Genesis 1, the heavens and the earth, which meant the universe, mm -hmm. are created before the days ever begin. In fact, if you look, Genesis 1-1 is about the universe, and then suddenly Genesis 1-2 is suddenly about the earth, and the earth was formless and void. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, how did we get from the universe just to the earth? Boom! How long did that take? We don't know. Right? And I don't have time to get into it now, but I actually think Genesis 1 is a polemic against the Egyptian creation story. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And we have to keep that in mind. We go through our STOP acronym, situation, type, object, Prescription or description? What's the situation when Paul, I'm at Paul, when Moses is writing Genesis? Who's he writing it to? He's not writing it mm -hmm. to us. He's writing it to people who just left Egypt. They're wandering through the desert. And when they're wandering through the desert, they're not asking the questions we're asking. They're not walking through going, I wonder how old this place is. Right? <laughs> That's not their question, right? Mm -hmm. Their question is, is Yahweh the true God or are the Egyptian gods the true gods? That's what Moses is answering. All right. Uh, just one quick follow-up. I believe when when it says death entered, no, sorry, sin entered the world. Mm -hmm. That word "world" is mm -hmm. the same word used when it says before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. So it does seem to me like the world being used there is all of creation and not just humankind. That well, remember difference. there was a fall before the fall. The fall in heaven. Yeah. Of the, the fall first of Satan, angels, which is not explained. Yeah. Right. We simply don't know. I, we just can't use Romans five twelve and put. Death came to all creation in 512 because it doesn't say that. It says death came to all men. And, and how do men get saved? Through the second Adam, Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's not talking about how llamas get saved, mm -hmm. right, or snakes. He's talking about men. So this is a, yeah. a parallel here. So, so there could, though, be um, a world with you know, possibly millions of years of animal death that would be good apart from sin? There could be, sure. Okay. God can redeem it all. Yeah, there's, there's even death now, obviously, and God can redeem that. Mm -hmm. sure. But this world is clearly fallen. Of course it is. So before the fall, there could be millions of years of animal death? There was a fall before the fall, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only that, the fall of Adam could have been retroactive 
What's the matter? You can't stay for six hours? <laughs> <laughs> the fall for Adam could have been retroactive just like the salvation of Jesus was retroactive. In mm -hmm. other words, what happened with Adam could have affected the universe prior to Adam coming, just like the salvation of Jesus affected the salvation of people who came before Jesus. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Oh, we exceeded our time limit for last question, and we got to go. They got to reset the room. Oh, we don't have any more time for questions, and we got to go. We got to go. Sorry, guys. And everybody out there, by the way, we're going to be at Ooey Pooey Thursday night. And you can see it. You can see it on YouTube. Thanks for being here.